Chapter 15 Rumors abound of a monster appearing at a restricted meeting for selected government personnel. The damage discovered to the floor of the auditorium provides evidence that something happened, but the odds of a giant green monster appearing implies that maybe there were less meeting going on and more drug sampling than normal. CNN Mage Focus To my surprise and relief, we didn't step into the council chamber, but instead into a glade that didn't feel familiar. I crossed my arms and stared at Esmir. Do you want to explain what all that was about? She snarled a bit, pacing even as Carolyn stood guard in front of me. His stance worried me, and I feared Esmir was under more pressure than I understood. This is an ambush that I'm forced into participating with, and I detest that. You are about to be backed into a corner, but I am unsure how or why. Briggs is up to something, and that is normal. But the machinations being done now make no sense. The realms are not stable for the first time in my memory, but I am not that old. Her words jabbed into my mind with the force of daggers, and I fought to hide my flinches. Why does Bricks care about me one way or another? Tersane mentioned that too. I wasn't sure how to deal with this aspect of Esmir. Kath didn't take well to being forced to do things. I am unsure, but Bricks is old. Very old. She paused her stocking back and forth, but her tail still cracked back and forth. In fact, Bricks might be the oldest being I know of. Even Smog remembers Bricks from when she was only a hatchling. If she had human expressions, I would have expected narrow eyes and pursed lips. As it was, she had just gone completely still, on the hunt for prey. Okay, and? I'm not. Heck, I don't even have half a century on me. And really, outside my friends, it isn't like I've had a lot of interactions with the realms. She flicked an ear at me. We are all about manipulation and plans. Your very friendship has created waves. It is amusing, but I prefer to be the one generating waves, not being affected by them. She heaved out a sigh and shook her entire body. Ugh, gum. Just be prepared. I noted that she didn't say for what, so I brought my best offensive spells to the forefront. Cast Lady Luck on Carolyn and myself. Then I asked Air to stay near, even as I set up a bioelectrical shield. That would drain me, but I had time until I figured out what was going on. Ready? She glanced at me with ears flicking. No, but let's go anyhow. I kept my hand on Carolyn. Glad I'd put the harness on him. It had extra supplies that just might be needed if this blew up. The rip opened, and I stepped through to the council chamber, closing my eyes between one location and the next. I opened my eyes to Bedlam. Smog was in the yard, smoke slipping out of her nostrils and flames licking at the corners of her mouth. Tursane was talking to what I thought was a naga and Salastra, her snakes agitated and hissing at everyone. Bob all but writhed, and I was glad he wasn't talking. There was a small contingent of Valkyries in full battle armor, their wings out and acting like shields around them. Then there was Shay, Amadahi, and a short man with dark brown skin and hair that I didn't recognize. They were huddled together near the end of the council chamber, their backs against the wall, Magic was so heavy I could feel it in the air, taste it on my tongue. I stood there for a moment, unnoticed, and watched, this time paying attention to the dynamics. Everyone talked to everyone else, barging in, demanding attention, and not being shy about using magic to gain it. If you didn't know the realm a being was from, or what they represented, you would have no idea. Everyone mingled and argued, except the humans. Shit, culture is screwing us again, though I wouldn't have thought of Shay as shy. Watching for a bit longer, I realized the problem. All of the denizens were dangerous. Tursane had snakes, Esmir claws, 
Others had fangs, fire, sharp feathers. They could all harm soft, squishy humans without magic. We didn't even wear armor anymore. Esmir, when was the last time humans were on the council? I sent the question to her quietly. She had moved over to talk to a mix of species from chaos and spirit, with normal cat invisibility, and hadn't garnered much attention. Long before I was born, why? Just a theory. Thanks. Right then, I would have bet a lot of money the last time humans were here, we wore armor and carried swords. Our current existence made us much too soft physically. Crap, I whispered to myself and headed over to the other humans. I felt beings take notice of me as I moved through, sounds fluctuating as their attention wavered. You finally showed up. There's a reason you are supposed to answer your phone. Shay snapped as I stepped close enough they didn't need to shout. Oh, so it was you blowing up my phone. Well, since you did it while I was in the middle of speaking to a bunch of people for the FBI, with a general from the army, and a data analyst from the OMO sitting behind me, I didn't think it was a good time to check my messages. I gave him a withering look, and he just shrugged, dismissing my complaint, but he also didn't take his eyes off the beans behind us. Of all of us, I was the only one with my back to them. I'll have to address that in a bit. Now that I'm here... Want to tell me what was so all-fired important that it couldn't wait until I could read the messages and respond? You know, like another 15 minutes? My voice held a note of sharpness because I still didn't understand why I had to be here. Oh, yeah. All his indignation and irritation drained out of him. He took a deep breath. Hisahito is dead. It felt like I'd been gut-punched. We weren't friends but we'd finally moved into respected colleague territory, and I had wanted there to be more. More time, more discussion, more... something. I closed my eyes and processed it. How? Massive heart attack early this morning. For him, at least. I was contacted about it, and they let me know. Funeral is next week, and we are all invited. I'd never been a big fan of weddings and baby showers, even my own, but they were infinitely preferable to the number of funerals I was going to. Granted, even one was one too many. I see. I'm sorry to hear that. The grief stuck in my throat, a lump of might-have-beens that I struggled to swallow. But I'm not sure why I I had to be here. Dealing with Hisahito's death would come later. Right now, there was a more important item. Was this a scheduled council meeting? Why am I here? For that matter, why did Esmir come and grab me and probably set back human and denizen relations about a hundred years? That one annoyed me, and I knew I probably could have handled it better, but still. No clue. I got pinged about an hour ago that there was an emergency meeting and that you had to attend with us. I have no idea if they knew Hisahito had died or what caused it. Huh. I turned and looked at everyone, aware once again how only the humans were isolated. Okay, I'll deal with this in a moment. Amadahi? I said, facing her and the man next to her. He wasn't as old as she was, but he had to be at least as old as Shay, which, as always, made me the baby of the group. Then why am I the one in charge? I pushed the thought away and waited for Amadahi. This is Nara. He is who the AIN has chosen as my replacement. Good day, he said in a soft accent that sounded more Australian than anything else. It is an honor to be here. He glanced back at the vibrant room. If it be a bit overwhelming. Australian? I asked with a bit of confusion. Amadahi shrugged. We never said all the AIN members were from North America. We have been collecting indigenous people for a century. You'd be amazed at how much a Mongol, or what your culture calls an aborigine, enjoys living a life with no white men telling them what to do. We tend to refer to ourselves as First Nations peoples. The jab wasn't subtle, but I just shrugged. Sounds good to me. 
Hopefully, Nara, you have some experience with dealing with fractious other beings. I some. He just shrugged and looked around, more curious than wary. I started to ask more questions, but a trill that cut through my brain and soul stopped me. Everyone pivoted toward the source of the trill. Brick sat there in colorful, feathery glory. It was probably my imagination, but I could have sworn Bricks was staring at our small cluster. As the last counselor has arrived, please get situated. Visitors, please retreat to the gallery. The words cut through the chatter with a crystal sharp edge. Beans nodded to each other and went back to their places. Showtime, Shay said, his smile trembling a bit at the edges. He and Amadahi went to the chairs in the earth area. The other beans had filtered into their spots, with bricks at the head on his perch. It still felt like he was watching me, but it was difficult to tell. I shrugged it off and went to stand behind Shay, while Nara stood behind Amadahi. What disturbed me the most was the glances I kept getting from beans. Not Tursane or Esmir, but the rest. Lightning fast glimpses my direction— then they'd look away. At this point, it was only Bob and Salstra that weren't doing that, and I didn't know if Bob even had eyes. It took another minute for the watchers to disappear. For the first time, I realized that above us was actually a gallery, but the shadows were such that you couldn't easily see anyone up there. The light in the chamber was bright enough that it kept the shadows all but impenetrable. However, I could hear the rustling and sounds telling me there were many beings up there watching. Brooks's wings waved up and down. The ring clacked against the wooden perch, drawing all eyes to the phoenix. We have gathered for an emergency meeting. His head rotated through each section, then fastened on us. Earth, where is your third counselor? The empty chair screamed a banshee cry of emptiness in this place. Shay stood, moving up a bit. Our third counselor died this morning, and we have not had time to find another representative. Bricks hesitated, then head dipped in our direction. Your loss is noted. However, three is required. Shay shrugged. Amadahi and I can handle it until we have a third. Nara here is apprenticing to take over for Amadahi when she steps down. That is not acceptable. There must be three. Brick snapped out, the words cutting literally. Then Nara can step up, Shay suggested, his voice still calm. No, we do not need more than one representative from the beast realms. There must be three. For some reason, the realm denizens tended to refer to the AIN as the beast realm, which made zero sense to me. I just rolled with it, though I didn't understand the emphatic statement. Why was it such a big deal? Harold Corey Monroe can serve as the third counselor. The amount of smugness in Brooks's voice made me grit my teeth. I didn't want anything to do with this. Not happening. I'm not a good person to be a counselor. Let Nara stand in for a while. I spoke clearly, even though everyone in the room was focused on me, except Tersane. She watched Bricks. Her snakes coiled and tight. Esmir had her eyes shut, but her ears were flicked back toward me, tracking everything. No exception. Why? I demanded, cutting Bricks off. Half the beans in there froze at my rudeness, or whatever. Maybe you didn't do that. Bricks flared up, flames licking across the multicolored body. Because it is required for counselors of the realms to have three each to support the different aspects of magic. We required Merlins from Earth as your mages are corrupted and do not understand or use magic to its fullest. Your delegation must be complete. Then wait, I snapped out. Someone died and you can bloody well wait. I almost felt the shock of my words ripple around the room. Most of you are well over a hundred years old, and some of you live for thousands of years. 
We don't. Living to a hundred is rare, and we die from the stupidest things. You have time. Give us the few weeks we need to get this straightened out. Shay and Amadahi were staring at me like I'd grown another head, but my patience level had gone. Between my family moving out of the house, the rips, everyone wanting me to solve things, and information being kept from me, I didn't care. And if they wanted to get nasty, go for it. Carolyn pressed against my leg and purred. It was all I needed to know. I had to put my foot down now. Flames were shooting up around bricks, and I reached for water, more than willing to make this into a fight. Cor San Monroe, I am calling in one of the debts you owe me and mine. Salstra demanded across the chamber. Bricks had nothing on Salstra for a cutting voice. It sliced through my anger and my left arm burned. I glanced down at it to see the unicorn horn glowing on it, snapping my mouth shut. I pivoted a bit to face her. She had walked out into the ring facing me. Her horn glowed in the light, and silver hooves glimmered with malevolence as she focused on me. Fuck. Chapter 16 Is anyone else having weird conversations with their familiar? We know they talk to each other, just not the other mages, but are they dropping weird comments? Mine mentioned the council's having issues, or this random comment, the Earth Lords aren't effective. Yet when I ask what they are talking about, they just give me this look. And I swear it is a pitying look. If anyone is having the same, could you contact me? I'm starting to wonder if I'm going crazy or my familiar is. House of Emrys, message board. With a force of will, I pushed down my annoyance at this entire situation and nodded to her, one hand still on Carolyn's head. He'd stopped purring, and that worried me a touch. Yes, Salastra, I owe you a favor, one of three. What is it that you ask of me? I couldn't even think as I waited. She had the right to ask almost anything of me. I require of you to take the position of Earth Lord and represent your realm in the council. Her voice was like a crystal clear bell slicing through my mind, and I fought off the pain. Why? The word slipped out, and I knew it shouldn't have. I had no right to ask why. There were debts I owed her. Technically, she could ask for me to cut off my left hand, and I wouldn't have much wiggle room. She turned her head, so one eye peered directly at me. Because that is the debt I collect. Her tone didn't change, though the feel of the bell got colder. I had zero choice. Very well, Salastra. I glared at Bricks, knowing the bird had something to do with this. But why? I accept the position as counselor. Earth Lord. Bricks replied with smugness in his voice that really had me itching to ice his tail feathers. If I spoke, I might say something that would create even more problems. My head jerked down in what could be called a nod, and I stepped backward toward the chair. When had I walked so far out? You must swear the oath first. Bricks's voice stopped me mid-step. Excuse me? The oath... It is required for realm lords. It was certain. I was icing his tail when I got a chance. I glanced back at Shay and Amadahi. Did you two swear an oath? Neither of them looked worried. Sure, Shay said, shrugging. It was the I promised to do my job to the best of my ability boilerplate. Nothing that I worried about. Amadahi nodded. Very similar to the swearing-in people do in your court systems. In the justice system, witnesses swore on a copy of the Bill of Rights to tell the truth and uphold it as they knew it. I nodded, my teeth clenched. I might just kill everyone, I sent to Carolan. Rather than chiding me, he rubbed his face along my hand. 
A blood oath would be glorious. We would feast for days. I dropped my head and tried not to laugh. Bloodthirsty calf. What is the oath? I asked, facing Bricks once again. The bird fluffed up and multicolored eyes twinkled at me. Repeat after me. I nodded, waiting. I, Coruscant Monroe, swear to tell nothing but the truth to the council. Bricks paused, and I shook my head. The whole oath first. If that bird could turn glares into lasers, Bricks's eyes would have burned me. I, name of Lord, swear to tell nothing but the truth to the council. I swear to share all information pertinent to the council inquiries. I will respect and defer to my senior lord's requests. I swear to protect and serve magic to the best of my ability and the safety of the realms. Brix's feathers were puffed up as the tension stretched out. I won't be swearing that, I said, my gaze never drifting off of Brix. A chatter broke out among everyone, but my eyes stayed on Brix. That is unacceptable. You must take this oath. Not that one. I held up my hand as the noise erupted again. There are a few things that will need to change. First, I usually tell the truth, but I cannot swear to tell nothing but the truth. I may tell you a lie, believing it is the truth and I won't be forsworn on my oath. Brix's feathers unruffled a tiny bit at that, but I kept going. Second, I cannot swear to share all information. Some knowledge I have is not mine to share, and I will not tell you. I can tell you what I can share, but I won't spill secrets that aren't mine. I heard a bit of hissing at that, but I could have sworn some of the noises were approving. Third, I am not deferring to anyone based on age. You are all older than me, by centuries in many cases, and I'm not ever going to outlive you. So, no, I won't automatically cave to what you want me to do. I can swear to give the fellow counselors the same level of respect they give me. I smiled, showing my teeth with that comment. Carolyn laughed quietly in the back of my mind. I paused, letting the murmurs and other sounds surround me while I thought it out. Writing this out on a piece of paper would have been much easier. Here is what I will swear, I said once I had it in my mind cleanly. I, Coruscant Monroe, swear to deal fairly with the council. I will seek advice from other members, and I will protect and honor magic to the best of my ability. I had planned to see if Bricks accepted that, but as the last words fell from my mouth, magic washed through me, and on my right arm, a band of glowing symbols appeared. It was similar to what had happened during the joining, but instead of fading on my inner arm, the symbols of chaos, order, and spirit appeared in a row, each lined with precision and all the sections filled with an iridescent color that changed in the light as I moved. And magic has accepted her oath. Tersane's voice rang out loud and clear. So mote it be, rang out in my head and my ears through the chamber. I managed to drag my focus away from the new marks on my skin and look at Bricks. The rage in Bricks's eyes should have been enough to turn me into a crisp little pile of ash. Instead, every feather was clamped tight to the phoenix's body, though flames licked at the bottom of the multicolored tail. Welcome to the council, Lord Monroe. Every word sounding like it had been forced out between two ice cubes. Thank you, I said with a smile as false as the welcome. With a pivot that would have made Stephen proud, I spun on my heel and stepped back into the Earth Realm ring. They all stood there, staring at me, eyes wide and mouths agape. What? I asked when I got nearer. You backtalked them. You defied them. You defied bricks. Shay whispered, seeming more cowed than I thought he knew how to be. Whispering is a waste of time. Most of them have much better hearing than we do. And yes, don't you? 
He and Amadahi traded lightning-fast glances. Not really. We are usually polite and keep everything civil. Have they threatened you? I asked, all the pieces falling in place. Shay shook his head. No, but we saw Bricks flame someone that argued with him. It was made very clear to keep our place. No, I keep Kalechia here on his perch. They just are unfailingly polite even though they brandish claws and fangs. Amadahi narrowed her eyes, inspecting me. You aren't surprised. Kalechia, why didn't you tell her? The Thunderbird stared at me for a long moment, and I started to think he wouldn't answer. Tell her what? That polite and deferential isn't the way to go? I was staring at him, ignoring the shock behind me, though I knew I didn't have much time. They are higher rank. They have precedence. Birds. Pecking order. Shit. I sighed. I'll explain later. For right now, let's see what exactly the issue is. I slumped in the chair, already exhausted from all the posturing. Now that Earth has decided to grace us with three counselors, settle down so we can discuss the matter at hand. This time, I paid attention to everyone as they settled down. No one looked at me directly, though Tursane's snakes bobbled hello every time they caught me glancing at them. The matter at hand is the magic over spillage, and it being wasted on the Earth realm. Energy sizzled through me. What was this? Tursane had talked about the magic bursting over, but not wasted, or calling it spillage. I glanced over at her, but other than the snakes bouncing in glee, her face remained an alabaster statue, beautiful but emotionless. Here are the ideas that have been suggested to utilize the excess magic and keep it here. Bricks paused and fluffed his wings. Did you know about this? I said quickly. Amadahi and Shay shook their heads, while Nara just looked terrified and out of his depth. I felt for him. First is the best one, but has the longest lead time. We need more offspring that want to follow our footsteps— too many of our children are looking at the study and sacrifice involved in becoming an active part of the magical world, and they are choosing the life of the beasts. Bricks didn't so much as send a feather in Kalichia's direction, but the Thunderbird bristled. We need to encourage them to follow in the path of magic. How can we do that? Bricks cast the question out. I do not see that we should, bird. Esmir drawled sitting demurely straight up, tail wrapped around her. The realms are full of lands created long ago. Their magic keeps those lands healthy, and who are we to dictate the choices of the young? Their parent, Bricks retorted in a sneering tone. Who else should guide them, if not you? What would you know of it? Avian lay eggs. You know nothing of the feel of children in you, squirming. Dying. It is not up to you to say how we should raise or guide those we birth. Her posture didn't change, but Esmir's scratching tone scalded my mind. Feckless cat, you let your litter die rather than protect them. I heard the shock at that remark, and I glanced over at Shay and Amadahi. They just seemed bored. You can hear them, right? Shay nodded. Yeah but they do this all the time. It's just banter. No, that was the equivalent of calling someone a fucking bitch. I countered as I went back to watching Esmir's ears. She didn't move them, but the tip of her tail had gone still. At least I had them. I encouraged them to live the lives they chose. Kirlene is here. His brother Aelin is happy with his pride, roaming the plains and managing the rodent population. Bayane is enjoying the beast realms and has great fun working with their herds. The others were born mindless and followed their nature. My litters are my business, not something to discuss in public. Next time you do so, I'll have new feather toys. 
Her whiskers flipped forward, and her body trembled with the need to pounce. Bricks turned on the perch, tail flipping. As so illustrated, even lords have a difficult time getting our offspring to submit to magic. Celestra has her quarterly dedications, but where there used to be dozens striving for each spot, now there is barely any competition. Does anyone have any ideas? I kept my mouth firmly clamped shut. I had no idea how to address population growth in the realms. I still didn't understand what parts were static and which were fluid. They were both and neither at the same time. That being said, creating another four to five pocket clades could use a great deal of magic, especially if they are filled with growing things so magic could seep into it and flood the area. Chaos has been working on that. He nodded toward chaos. Bob seemed to swell, though it was hard to tell with an amorphous blob. Esmir didn't move, but her whiskers were flat against her face. We need others to do this. It is a commitment of a few decades, but it will help give magic something to flood and fill, which will prevent it from spilling over into Earth. Tersane seemed to shrug, The ones with her barely seemed to be paying attention, but you could never tell. At the lack of reaction, Bricks huffed and continued. (sighs) The last option is to build more great works. Those disturb the design of the realm or pocket area, and magic has to flow into the work to resolve the changes. These are like the arena of order. If each realm built a new one, it would absorb large quantities of magic, This had a few heads perking up, but even though Zmog seemed bored with the proceedings, she still had smoke trickling out of her nose. Brix's wings flapped once. We must do something, and none of you have anything useful to suggest. I could always ask Tersane to quit collecting magic from humans on Earth that would otherwise be killed. The words slipped out and hit the room like a shotgun blast. Chapter 17 The death of Hisahito Yamato has created a wave of sorrow across large parts of Japan. Hisahito was well known as the Majutsushi for the emperor for years. A large funeral is being planned to honor him. The emperor was quoted as saying, He, Hisahito, was the one who found the way to seal our borders, and while it didn't work due to the cost in Japanese lives, the effort changed our country. He will be missed. We fully expect his funeral to be attended by representatives from all over the world, as is due his legacy. CNN Mage Focus I hadn't moved from the chair, though I was beating my head against a wall mentally. Apparently, keeping my mouth shut wasn't one of my skills. Every head in the room had snapped in my direction. The only one I cared about was Tersane. From this distance, her face was still a perfect mask, but her snakes were waving gently. I took that as positive. What are you talking about? Every word from Bricks felt like a knife jab in my brain. Oh, you weren't aware? I'm sorry. I thought you knew everything that was going on. I kept my tone normal and almost apologetic. Behind me, I heard Shay choking. Obviously not. Explain. It took everything I had not to wince at that, but I didn't follow up on the words. I just smiled. A few years ago, I made a request of Tersane to take the magic of someone that was about to be killed because she couldn't use her magic the way the government believes it should be used. Tersane asked if I wanted her to do that for anyone that either due to mental or health reasons was at risk of dying by our laws. I was desperate and said yes. I lifted up one shoulder, still slouched in the chair, though next time I was bringing a more comfortable club chair. Or I could transform this. The idea flickered through my mind and I focused on the chair. Here, magic was even easier to do, as I could touch all of it. The image of the club chair in my study held firm in my mind. I offered to magic. With barely any cost, the chair changed and I settled down in my rich leather chair. 
Ah, much better. We can do that. I heard Shay mutter. Tursane, why did you not tell us? Do the other lords know? Brix demanded, though I noted his words weren't stabs of pain this time. You never asked, and when I tried to tell you, you told me it wasn't my turn to speak. You just went on about how magic was so rich here and overflowing because we weren't using it properly. I didn't see any reason to fight to disabuse you of that notion. She shrugged in an elegant manner that I could never copy. Her snakes were braided back and none of them were looking at the phoenix. And of course they know. I've been dumping magic into them and their realms. It is just more than we realized, hence why it is bursting from all the realms. I'd never seen a bird sputter before, and I had to fight not to laugh. That wouldn't gain me anything. Why did you not say anything when I brought this up? Because it didn't change the problem. I can't keep all the magic I've been absorbing, and now it is too much for the realms, so the problem is still the same. Brick's world to face me. Make her stop. We can't deal with this influx of magic. These words sounded like they were pulled from him. I just didn't know if it was asking me or admitting they couldn't handle the magic amounts. It won't do any good, Tersane said before I could reply. I've tried to stop. I set it into motion, assuming it was going to be a small power boost. The number of people this affected made me drunk for weeks, but the magic has fused into a pipe I can't shut off. Magic won't let go for reasons I do not understand. Zmog had lifted her head, looking interested for the first time. Bricks hopped up and down on the perch, wings flailing and fire licking around, Council is dismissed. The words were still ringing in my mind when he vanished in a flash of angry flames. It was like a wire had been cut and various beams laughed or disappeared. Come on, this is part of the problem, I said to Shay and Amadahi as they headed over to Tursane. They followed behind me like lost chicks. Tursane, what was that all about? I asked, standing in front of her. Bricks thinks Bricks knows best. I tried twice to explain. Even Salastra mentioned something, but Bricks blew past all our explanations. It was easier to let it be run like this. Like I said, we still need to deal with the magic that is flooding us. Ah, uh, and me? Games? Salastra surprised me, but you can ask her. Tersane bent to peer at my new marks on my arms. They didn't really qualify as tattoos, as there was no ink involved. But still, the unicorn horn had one section filled with a pearly dark pink. On my right arm, the symbols of the realms created a line of power. I stared for a minute, and my joining band around my wrist popped into existence, then faded. You know, she won't tell me anything. I'll wait. Somehow, I think she'll be calling in her other debts soon. I would like to talk to you, Zmog said in my head, but I saw Tersane turn to look at her as well. I met Tersane's eyes and nodded. Come on, let's go talk to Zmog. Wait, we're going to talk to the dragon? Shay asked, and even Amadahi seemed apprehensive. I've seen that dragon get pissed and had to throw up a shield when it flamed everyone. Amadahi nodded. We have Gath, Erelez, the birds, but the dragons were never involved. The few times we sent representatives, they were eaten. Yeah, that sounds like them. She tries to eat me, and she'll get the worst case of indigestion she's ever had. Come on. I started that way. Tersane had already slithered over and rested in a coil talking to Smog. Smog, this is Shay and Amadahi and her apprentice, Nara. Please include them in this discussion. I didn't bother to stand. I just dropped down on the ground. Carolyn lay behind me, acting like a pillow. 
what's up? Zmog blew smoke out at both humans, but then turned or gazed to me. You gifted Darsane this power? There was an odd note of hurt in her voice. I sighed. That is not exactly the right way to look at it. I asked for one girl to be rescued. She asked if I wanted to rescue more than just her, and I said yes. The rest is completely on Tursane. Besides, this was before I met you or Tiatang. This wasn't me throwing Tursane under the bus. Simply the truth. I had no idea how she had done it or why she didn't immediately stop. By the time I realized how much magic this involved, the channels were fused, so I've been dumping magic everywhere. Why? She asked, her snakes stretching toward me. I gave in and petted them. They were almost as bad as Carolyn, maybe worse, as so many beings feared her and her snakes. Smog tilted her head. Gory, do you remember my explanation about why the Quetzos took so long to hatch? Sure, the magic on Earth is so much lower, it took them longer to develop. Many of the regions or pockets that we dragons prefer are still magic poor from being created. It is taking longer and longer of late, to the point some eggs are being abandoned. Tursane tilted her head, her brows drawn together. But they were created eons ago. Surely magic would have filled them back up. I remember when your hatchlings were fast and strong. Smog looked away, smoke wreathing her head. Dragons take more magic to live than most. We have absorbed most of the excess supply and exist. For the first time in a long time, our numbers are going down. She paused, but I didn't dare speak, waiting. It would be appreciated if you had any access to dump in our realms. Tursane looked at her for a long moment. Of course. One favor? Zmog's response was full of teeth, and I shuddered. Dragon smiles weren't friendly. Two favors that the dragons owe. I blinked at that. Not just a personal favor, but a species one. That was rare. Esmir had been teaching me the currency of most denizens, and favors, or barter, were really the only type. This was a huge price. I would be honored. I will see you soon, when the magic builds up again. She glanced at me. If Zmog's realms are as dry as she says, it should stop the rips from opening. For a while, at least. But there is still an issue. The magic influx isn't stopping, and I don't know if it ever will. At least it gives us some time. I rubbed my temple. Any idea when the next meeting is? That is up to Brix. They are called when Brix feels there is enough going on to warrant one. Tursane looked at me. We are still friends. I stared at her in surprise. Of course we are. This is all bricks, and I'm not sure what is going on. I'll have to go talk to Salastra, but later. I stood and nodded at Shay, Amadahi, and Nara. You want to stop at my place and talk, or are you done? Talk! Came out of all of their mouths before I barely finished speaking. Carolyn? Home, please? He stood up, stretching, then a sharp pain and a rip sat there. We walked through and were home. The weather is nice. I need something to drink. I glanced at my watch and sighed. It was barely afternoon. It had been a crazy busy day. But I guess I'm having coffee. You want something? They requested their chosen drinks, and I waved to the sunroom as I headed to the kitchen. Ten minutes later, we were all sitting there, drinks in hand, and at least some of them looking a bit shell-shocked. So, Shay said finally, This means you're on the council. Unfortunately, but I owe Salastra too much to be able to deny it. This is going to suck. I sighed and made a mental note to pull something out of the freezer for dinner. If Stephen and Indira were coming over, we'd need more. Amadahi shook her head. 
we were taught to be respectful to the denizens, as you call them, to honor their wisdom. I have spent my time trying to play diplomat, as did Hisahiro. And I tried to be a wise ass, but they don't react to sarcasm correctly, nor do they get my jokes. It's been exhausting, Shay admitted. His hands were wrapped around a Mexican coffee, as were mine. I felt exhausted, and the day wasn't even near done. I told you I wanted Merlins for a reason. They respect power, not words. You have to ignore all their posturing. I shrugged. It seemed obvious to me, but then I'd been dealing with them for a while. The dragon wouldn't have really incinerated you, Shay asked slowly. Oh, she absolutely would. Her son would be pissed about it, but she'd shrug and point out I had the means to protect myself. It wasn't her fault I was too dumb or slow. Oh, he said. Then, oh shit, really? I should have called them on everything and shoved it down their throat? Yep, I gave him a wan smile. They respect blunt power. Lying is a waste of time for almost anyone, as you never can tell who can detect lies. But playing with the truth is a pastime they all enjoy. Never quite lying, but never leaving you with the right idea. The other problem is you play the human card a bit too much. Huh? Came from Shay, while Amadahi just looked concerned. You stay and talk only to yourselves. They wander, butt in, force everyone to treat them as equals, or there is a slap, snarl, spell, something to prove they are too dangerous to be ignored. And you don't. You, well, we now have to go talk to them, bug them, ask them out for drinks afterwards for Merlin's sake. They drink? Shay asked in surprise. They are people. They drink or do catnip or whatever. Sometimes it is alcoholic or druggy or it is tea. Many of them like our teas or ciders. The Valkyries prefer craft beers or mead. I'd had the occasion to talk to Frey once or twice over the years. We weren't friends, but friendly. Oh. We talk about wanting to treat everyone equal, but yet we didn't. I fear the A.I.N. has hidden away from the world far too long. Amadahi's voice was quiet and heavy. It is time for me to step down. We need new, fresh outlooks. I still remember when the sky was free from contrails. That might not be a good thing in this situation. I revised how old I had thought she was and added another 20 years. Now you know. Anything else? They asked questions about the rips, a few more about the way to interact with denizens. You know, Corey, Shay said as they both rose to go home. I looked at him, waiting. I'm beginning to understand why the moniker Corey catastrophe was so accurate. You don't cause problems. You simply attract them. He gave me a wan grin. Then they went home. I looked at my phone and the multiple missed messages. I didn't bother to respond to any of the messages from Stephen. Instead, I texted Indira. Dinner? My house? Seven? Caroline can come get you. Excellent. See you then. The text flashed across my screen and I smiled. Indira was so much easier to deal with than Stephen. Chapter 18 The government has finally decided to deal with these attacks on our country. A task force has been created to address these issues. The military, FBI, and the OMO are working together to address these issues. With luck, they will stop this egregious assault against our hardworking citizens. Pro Magic Radio Talk Show Host Chaos abounded in the house while Carolian went to get our dinner guests. Ver and Azul were nestled in the kids' hair after spending 20 minutes running around, then gorging themselves again. They'd luckily slept most of the day, and their one feeding Hamadia had taken care of. The two Ketsos hadn't figured out how to fly yet, but they thought riding in the hair and flapping their wings was excellent. So far, their words were food, hungry, and mine. 
all at headache-causing levels. Caroline was working on that. I turned at the stab of pain to see Stephen and Indira walking in from the sunroom. He was still wearing the same suit as this morning, minus the tie, though he looked as exhausted as I felt. Indira looked gorgeous as always. Silver had crept up at her temples, making it look like she had silver wings. At over 60, she still looked 20 years younger. Corey, how are you? She swept forward and pulled me into a hug. I returned it warmly. Over the years, she had become a big sister that I enjoyed very much. Ask me again after dinner, that is, if he doesn't strangle me. I tilted my head towards Stephen. He sighed and gave me a hug. Ugh, I'm not planning on strangling you, though I wouldn't blame you if you did that to me. I am sorry. I waved my hand. It's been a weird day. Explain when everyone can hear. By mutual decision, we kept the chatter to life. School, the twins, and their familiars until the steak, salad, and potatoes were inhaled, and the kids were upstairs with their ketzos. They had decided to read to them and had books out that they were reading to the dragons. In reality, they were making up words to go with the pictures, but it amused them, and the ketzos seemed very excited or hungry. They were hard to read at this stage. We gathered in the sunroom, stoking the fire. All of us had adult beverages, mainly because after today, I knew I needed one, and I suspected by the time it was over, Joe and Sable would be very glad of a few drinks. So, explain what that was about, Stephen. I gave him a hard look. I wasn't mad, exactly, but being blindsided like that was annoying, to say the least. He sighed and buried his nose in his whiskey. I know I said I had a response team, and I wanted you on it. And as of Friday, that was what I had. First thing this morning, and I mean first thing, the head of the FBI was calling me at 5 a.m. We all winced at that. It was one of the things I was looking forward to the most, a new schedule where I didn't need to get up until after 9 a.m., That 5 a.m. call told me they had an auditorium scheduled. The general and a report analyst from OMO would be there, and they already had sent out the invitations. He took another sip of whiskey, then obviously relaxed his grip on the glass. I asked what I was supposed to do, and the director said he had given me the tools. My pet, Super Merlin, would be there. I should figure it out and stop this problem. I probably should have called you, but at this point I figured everyone was going to be pissed at me. I might as well have you pissed too. Besides, I didn't know what else to do. He quirked up a side of his mouth. It turns out having a portal open, a cat the size of a horse on steroids, come out and lambaste a general's is actually a good way to nip issues in the bud. We all choked, and even Carolyn found that funny. Esmir wasn't that large, but I suspect the adrenaline had exaggerated a lot. After that, I read the director the riot act and told him if he ever pulls that shit again, I'll quit. Then he can find someone new to deal with. He apologized and said it had been dumped on him too. It turned out someone above both of us from the president's advisors had set it up, then had their star back out, so they dumped it on me. Ah... That makes much more sense now. Joel was way too prepared, as was everyone else, to be that random. But it doesn't solve the problem that I don't know how to stop the rips, though I suspect they are going to fall off for a bit. Oh? Indira said. She held a glass of wine in her hands, twirling it more than drinking it. I took a deep breath and explained. Everything tumbling out, the magic, tersane, the dumping... Then the dragons. By the end of it, Stephen looked shell-shocked and drained his whiskey. He got up and refilled it, bringing the bottle of Zinfandel back for Indira. She gave it a long look, and I waited for her to grab the bottle and start chugging. But instead, she filled her glass all the way up, which all but emptied the bottle. Are you saying your desire to save one girl started this whole domino? And you're now a lord of earth to a council that I didn't even know existed. 
and the dragons want the extra magic dumped into where they live so their eggs will hatch faster, he said slowly, his eyes bouncing between me, Joe, and Sable. To be honest, Joe and Sable were surprised with everything that had changed in one day, too. Pretty much, I admitted, sipping my gin and tonic. I liked the bitter edge. It reminded me not to get too complacent. Glory catastrophe indeed, he muttered, taking another sip. A flicker of annoyance bubbled up, but I couldn't really disagree, and here I'd thought I'd left that moniker behind a decade ago. I think I understand everything, but from what you said, it is only going to slow down the ruptures, not stop them. He clarified with a far-off look on his face. Correct. It will completely screw up the calculations done by Joel. But in the end, there will still be a massive issue. That didn't make me happy, especially as I still wasn't sure what the ultimate answer was. There was so much history going on, and there was stuff here I didn't understand. And that drove me crazy. Unanswered questions usually did. Okay. And I can't really tell anyone this. They wouldn't believe me, or worse, they would, and they'd demand to be on the council and control the information being provided. Joe laughed out loud. <laughs> Good luck with that. They can bleed their case to smog or bricks. They wouldn't return to complain about anything. We all snickered at that. What I don't understand, Indira said finally, the level in her wine glass much lower, is why this is happening. Most of the resources we have are static or renew at a steady rate. I looked at her with a blank look, and others must have too. As I understand it, there is only so much gold, iron, or coal in the earth. Once that is gone, we can't effectively make more. But air, food, wood, all of that is replaceable, and we know the rates at which we can make it, which is magic. Most of the mages I've ever talked to just assumed it was a natural thing like a mineral. What is there is there, and your ability to use it is based off your skills. We all nodded, and my mind started to race, following her logic. Indira continued in the same thoughtful voice. But if you say Tersane is pulling the magic from people, that means it is a live thing that changes and grows. What determines how it grows— and is it something we need to stop? Do we use it up? If there is too much, will Earth rupture into the realms? Why now? Why not 200 years ago? Is that what started all of this in the first place? Ugh, I muttered as I took another sip. I don't know, but I think you're right. And there is something we very much don't understand but I don't get the feeling the council does, or at least not all the council. I can force the issue and ask, but it will be complicated. It always is, Stephen said with a smile. For now, I still need to set up task forces and work with the army, but can you offer classes on shutting down rips? You can open them, right? I guess. They need to be soul, but I can't start running people through. But I can tell you the rips I open are much easier to close than what that rip was. It looks like my retirement was going to be spent going crazy again. What do you mean? Indira leaned forward, looking at me. I couldn't think of any way to explain, so I showed her. Here, close this rip. I created a small rip about a foot across to the crossroad area that Caroline used so much. That's new... She said slowly. I blinked and flushed. I hadn't mentioned the full Merlin thing to them. I floundered, trying to come up with a non-lie to tell them, then shrugged. Yeah, Tersane pointed something out to me that I am strong in all the branches and classes. It's a thing, but I didn't think bringing it to the attention of the OMO or anyone else was necessarily a good thing. How long... This was from Stephen, and I sighed. <sighs> Before the twins were born? He opened his mouth, but Joe jumped in. Let it be. She was still in the draft. I know you tend to see people as problems to solve, 
but she isn't yours. We have first dibs and you don't get to steal her. Stephen glared at them, then sighed. Ugh, yes, ma'am. He turned to look at Indira with a pout. See, I must be getting old. My glares don't even face them anymore. Indira's brow arched up. I was unaware they ever did. Now I'm feeling picked on. You were going to show us something, Corey. Stephen redirected a side glare at Indira. Not bothering to hide my laughter at him, I glanced at Indira. Can you feel the rip? Close it. She nodded. Then a moment later, the rip closed. Okay. How much did that cost? Oh, about an eighth of a nail. She peered at her fingers. This is why I never bother to get manicures. Caroline, can you open a rip about the same size? I hadn't actually tested this, but I had a suspicion. A flash of pain and another rip. She reached out and closed it, frowning. That was much more difficult. Were they different places? No, both to a stable, neutral pocket. How much more? Her brows drew together. Say, a tenth of an inch from all of my hair? This is just my theory, but I think when magic itself tears the fabric between the realms, you have to be stronger than it was to rip it open, whereas when we open the rips, they are low energy and effort. I shrugged. But that is just my guess. When Carolyn opens them, he does it by imagining a claw ripping open the curtain. I use a sharp knife and minimal effort. Or I'm completely wrong. I shook my head to the chuckles. Whatever it is, the rips are much harder, so you will need fast reacting teams and at least archmages, if not Merlins. Hmm, that gives me an idea. Enough of that for now. Corey, you okay with the disaster I sprang on you? Stephen asked, giving me a quirked up mouth for a smile, but his shoulders were rigid. Merlin, no. You owe me. Per Carolyn, he says you owe us a deep sea fishing trip where we get to keep our prey. The flicker of shock on their faces, then laughter, made me grin. Stephen laughed the loudest, the stress bleeding away from him. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. Let's get this dealt with and we'll all go fishing. The evening ended with laughter and Carolyn rhapsodizing over the idea of fresh swordfish. Chapter 19 Do we ask enough of mages? We all know any mage over a hedgie is required to do draft service, but is it enough? Mages after draft are consistently in the top 10% of all earners in the U.S. They get jobs that no one else, regardless of their intelligence, could get. They are paid obscenely well and other than taxes return nothing to their communities. Is this enough compensation for the largesse they receive? I don't think so. I think mages should be taxed at higher rates and all their estates that do not go to blood kin should be seized for distribution to the lowest earners in our country. Editorial Opinion I woke up the next morning way too early for a Tuesday, but my brain was buzzing with ideas. The logic of the rips and the OMO data wouldn't leave my mind, as well as an idea about how to deal with getting them closed fast enough. The coffee maker beeped, and I grabbed my coffee before I slipped into the sunroom to stare at the slowly brightening day. Are you okay, Corey? Hamadia's voice came from my right, and I glanced at her. Just thinking, does anyone know the origin of magic? What makes it? Magic just is, like the air and light. I would not exist without it. She seemed confused by my question, and I couldn't blame her. Okay, how are your sister daughters coming? Joe and Sable were headed over to the house after they got home to decide what remodeling they wanted to do, and what they needed to do before the dryad was planted in the house. Hamadia's face glowed with little green leaves tracing along her cheekbones. They are growing so fast. I think they know they will be planted someplace wonderful. 
I grinned. When do we need to be ready to plant them? Not any sooner than two months, no longer than two years, she said after spinning in a circle for a while. I think we can handle that. I heard the sounds of kids getting up and happy hisses of the quetzos. Then a food that cut through my mind. Himadia winced too. Yeah, they are loud. Hopefully soon they'll chill out. Sister daughters are much easier. They do not shriek like that. Her eyes narrowed. Or at least mine will not. I laughed and rose to go in and start breakfast. Then I had plans that involved a calf. One hour later, after food, dressing, arguments about, no, you can't take them to school, the house was finally empty. The two dragons were glutted and curled back up in their sand basin snoozing. Smog had verified this was normal for the first month. They would grow very fast, but they would primarily eat and sleep. Carolian had only bothered to bestir himself when he smelled the bacon. You ready to talk to your mother? He flicked an ear at me from where he lay on the floor. I had the fireplace going in the sunroom with all the windows shut, so the heat with the cool autumn view was relaxing. Would it matter if I said no? Of course, I said, slightly hurt. I'm not looking to make you uncomfortable. You are a strange creature, my queen, but that is why I chose you. He closed his eyes and went back to enjoying the heat. I pinged Esmir. Interested in talking? Before I'd finished the words, a tiny slash of pain and she was there. For the first time, she looked small, and I couldn't understand why until I realized she was contained. Her fur flat, tail tucked in, whiskers back. It felt and looked wrong. I stared at her trying to figure out where to start, and she just waited. Can I still trust you? Will you hurt me or my family? If I had attacked her, I don't think she could have been more shocked. I will never hurt you or your family. Bob and Salastor can both go to the void if they think that would happen. You are mine as much as Gerlian is. Family is odd among Gath, either very tight or almost strangers. But you are my child's queen. I would never hurt you. I stood up and walked over to her. Then I wrapped my arms around her neck. I love you, Esmir. I know I'm human, but you are loved just the same. And I will always trust you. Her purrs rumbled through my body as she relaxed into my arms. You are the most powerful queen I've ever seen, Cory Monroe. Her words were soft. See, I choose my queens well. Carolian slipped in, his voice smug. I rolled my eyes as I released her and sat back down. So, what is going on? I see the problems with the humans and I'll address that. But why did Salastra call in my favor like that and bricks require three? Surely you've had other counselors miss meetings. She curled up in a loaf, the light flickering off her fur. Yes, we've had more meetings in the last five years than we've had in the last twenty. Part of it is the magic influx, but Brix is agitated about something and I think Bob knows. Knows what? What does this have to do with me being a counselor? I rubbed my face, exhausted already with all the political games. Corey, you are very direct and honest. We have been playing these games for centuries. I'm not sure that Bob isn't the same as the primordial essence of chaos that arose when magic did, but he might also be a creature that is a week old. He doesn't talk much to anyone. She looked like she was about to fall asleep, but her tail still twitched, occasionally going out to tap Carolian. A soft touch more of a caress than anything else. That I can buy, but Salastra? The horse and I don't talk as much as we once did. She prefers Tursane. Of course, most of us do. She is a good person. 
even if she isn't always nice. Most of us aren't. But Briggs is your real problem, and I don't know what the issue is. Briggs is forcing things, and no one is fighting back. I've only been on the council for a few decades, and most of them have been snooze fests. I think the last excitement before you came into our lives was Smog and Onyx eating some animals the Valkyries had been raising. That took a week to come to an agreement. She laughed in my mind. <laughs> it was amusing. But since you came to Brix's notice, something has changed. But I do not know what. I sighed. <sighs> okay, I'll fumble through as usual. But I'm going to push it next meeting. They might not like it. Good. Your other counselors are too placating. Yeah, I'll deal. We good? Always. Are the children here? Her ears twitched. I do not hear them. No, they went to school. But do you want to meet their dragons? I rose up as I spoke. Yes, let's investigate the small dragons. We arrived in the room and two little heads, one green, one blue, popped up over the basin, blinking at us. The two sets of wings flapped, spreading sand everywhere. This is Ver, and this is Azul. I picked them up one at a time and introduced them to Esmir. Play! The words burst through my mind, and I flinched in pain. Anyone that hasn't experienced it can't understand what it is like to have a voice at the decibel level of an air horn screaming words in your mind. Esmir hissed. <laughs> No, you do not talk like that. It wasn't to me, but it felt like she had whacked my nose with her tail. Focus on the word and say it. Shouting is not allowed unless it is an emergency. Food! Another whack on the nose. I started to figure out how she was doing it, which was probably why she was including me. That is not an emergency. You are not in pain. No one is in danger. That is a want. Now try again. Food! She whacked again. Quiet and focused all the way through the word. I started to see how she was whacking them. It was the equivalent of making a popping sound with your mouth, but directing it as a mental tap at someone. It was odd, but it worked as it felt like a nose bop in your mind. Food! Yes, better. Corey? I reached for the little food storage space Hamadia had set up. She'd tried to explain how she kept the food in a vacuum of cold until we opened it. Then the food would be available, not in a vacuum. But it made zero sense and I couldn't replicate it. Either way, it worked and kept the food cold. I pulled out slices of fish and chicken for them, with the tongs sitting there for that purpose. They inhaled, but the sounds of pleasure didn't make my brain want to bleed. After the round of gorging, they curled back up to sleep and we went downstairs. I will see if I can corner bricks and find out where the antagonism comes from, but I promise nothing. Either way, it doesn't matter. I'll still be a counselor. I'm more concerned with why or what I'm being manipulated toward. I agree. I will investigate. Esmir hesitated, then looked at me as we stood in the entrance to the sunroom. Carolyn hadn't moved, still laying there like a red rug. Corey, you are special and unique. I find myself wishing that magic doesn't change who you are. Before I could respond, she was gone. What was that, Carolyn? I asked, staring at where she had stepped back to the realms. He rolled over on his back, stretching out and yawning. Inside my head, he replied, She was saying she loved you. We don't love the way you humans do. It is rather addictive. I don't know how long I would have stood there like that in a state of shock and surprise if my phone hadn't rung. Hey, Stephen, what's up? Making separate ringtones for everyone was one of my best ideas. So, 
The army denied my request for help from their various bases, which means I still have no way to respond correctly. There hasn't been another rip yet, or at least not that I've heard about, but if they do start spewing out more creatures, most humans can't handle them. The random idea that had flitted through my brain surfaced. Contact the societies. What? He sounded lost, and I didn't blame him. You have all the societies that mostly have people that are out of the draft in them. Put out a call, see if they'll establish a hotline or something. Rip here, close it, and get X from the government. The House of Emrys at least would have a ball getting to study them, as Area 51 is off limits. Most of them are more than strong enough to deal with creatures and close it. Merlin, if I know those mages, you might have people fighting for the chance if you can tell them when and where it is. There was a long moment of silence on the other end. I'm not sure why that didn't occur to me. Any other brilliant ideas I can steal? Depends on if you're asking how to close them or if you're talking about something else. I had moved to stare out at the fountain, proof of my power when I didn't pay attention. You have another idea of closing them? He sounded curious, and while he could be an ass, he was still a good man. Create response units with seniors in college. Focus on those in the spirit track and arrange for them to get credit through the college for responding. There are enough colleges across the nation that the odds of them being closer to an incident are pretty good. Steven started laughing. (laughs) You sure you don't want my job? You're thinking circles around me. Thanks, but not a chance. You are just too lost in the bureaucratic process. You can't break out of it. I'm ignoring all of it and treating it as a game problem where the only things that are impossible are what you haven't tried. But I'm more than happy to accept my consultant's fee. Deal. What other words of wisdom do you feel like dropping? He laughed as he said it. Don't know if this is a word of wisdom, but don't you find it very interesting that when the rips have only been happening for a few weeks... The OMO already had all the algorithms figured out and a forecast created. It's almost as if they know how much magic is getting siphoned away by Tersane. Well, I mean... He trailed off. Do you think they know about Tersane? Why not? I got questioned about it. I explained what happened. While I might not talk about it, I can't imagine it wasn't reported up the chain. But that wouldn't mean they have some idea of how many people should be mages, or were mages and aren't now. Isn't that the entire point of the OMO? Corey, I don't like talking to you. You upset my worldview way too much. I laughed. (laughs) Happy to help. (laughs) He hung up, and I stood there wondering what else was going to happen. Chapter 20 Troop movements have been spotted in China, Russia, Poland, and the Ukraine, but contrary to normal troop movements where you would see them massing at certain points or borders, these are the opposite. Everything from tanks to SAMs to infantry personnel is being scattered everywhere. While this has been rumored to be a response to rips from the realms, this level of deployment indicates maybe something else is going on. CNN Everything stayed quiet for the next few days, though it felt like I was holding my breath the entire time. But nothing ripped, blew up, changed, or fell apart before Saturday morning, which let us start our brand new adventure. A horn outside the house blew at the agonizingly early 7 a.m. However, we had already been up since the even more horridly early 6 a.m., The group of us tumbled outside, the two Quetzos on the kids' shoulders. Sanchez sat in the driveway behind a huge moving truck, with Marisol waving from the front seat. The smile on her face burned away any lingering concerns we had. Sleepyheads, let's get going. We've been driving since three this morning. Someone couldn't sleep because she was too excited. Sanchez grinned and nodded at Marisol. Sure, blame it on mommy, Joe said with a laugh, headed toward them. Pack up and go to the craftsman's down the street. It's ready for you. She waved toward the house that was the first one on our street. 
We'd had a cleaning crew come in and scour it from top to bottom. Then we'd been over in the evenings to get it ready for a dryad. Aye, aye, Captain, Sanchez saluted as Marisol laughed and slapped his shoulder. The twins raced after them, the quetzos with their claws anchored in hair or clothing streaming like banners behind them. The adults moved a bit slower, coffee in hand as we headed there. Thank you, Corey. Joe said as we walked. Four? I glanced at her, confused. You gave the house to Mommy. You could have rented it out and made lots of money, kept it as a retreat, anything. You gave it to her. Joe, I stopped and pulled on her arm to make her stop with me. She has been more of a mother than mine ever was. She is the grandmother of my children, Carolyn and Esmir adore her. Why wouldn't I? Money used to be important, but now I can get what I need. So I'd rather have her here, happy, and get to spend more time with the kids. There is nothing to thank me for. It is literally the very least I could do. Joe burst out into laughter and pulled me into a tight hug, smacking me on the cheek with a kiss. Only you would think that, Corey. We are the luckiest people in the world to have you as part of our family. She held me and I sank into it. It felt good in a way only my heart understood. Hey, you two coming or are you going to let us do all the work? Sanchez yelled from the driveway. Joe yelled back. Let you do it all, of course. That's what brothers are for. But we sped up our walk and got there about the time he had the doors open to the back of the moving truck, and Marisol was inside, pointing out where things should go. The only magic any of us knew to making things lighter was air, and Marisol threatened to never cook for us again if we did that. Control wasn't something easy with air. We lifted it all the hard way. But three hours later, everything was in the house. It was a decent-sized craftsman house with simple details, but having seen how Hamadia changed our house, I had no doubt it would become more intricate as time went by. On the main floor was a master bedroom with ensuite, open living room leading to the kitchen, a half bath, and a study. It had a big front porch and a smaller back one that Joe and Sanchez had already decided needed to be a sunroom like ours. Downstairs were what had been created as a bathroom and two bedrooms, but the previous owners had made it into storage and a laundry room, perfect for what we needed. Are you ready? I turned to see Hamadia at the back door, peeking in. Marisol, are you ready to plant and take care of a dryad? I asked, rather than answering for her. Marisol stuck her head around the corner, dressed in jeans, a t-shirt, and a scarf over her head. She looked about ten years younger than she had two months ago. If you are ready, Amaria, then I am. She smiled, but swallowed nervously. I uh, hope you'll help me to take good care of your child. Amaria's smile revealed moss-green teeth with joy radiating out of her. I know you will. It will be good to create a grove here on Earth— Shall we? We traipsed down the stairs to where we'd plant Alina. Over the last few weeks, Sanchez, Joe, and Hamadia had created a hidden room in the basement that was a haven for a tree. Water systems, UV lights until she got older, food, and rich soil. Hamadia had worked to alter the framing of the house so that her sister daughter could grow into it, become it. There was much I didn't understand on how it worked, but she seemed very certain and was glowing. After this, they would start the same process on the Tudor house, but there was much more work to be done there. Hamadia was okay with waiting, as it was such a big house. She wanted her child to mature a bit more before separating her. As far as I could gather, dryads didn't seed. They sent out saplings. Normally, they treated these like extra limbs— but they could choose to make the sapling fully independent of their systems. That action created a child. All in all, I had to admit it sounded less stressful than being pregnant for nine months. The small room was behind a hidden door, 
which entertained all of them greatly when they created it. It looked just like a wall when you came down the stairs, and there was nothing to indicate anything else should be there. Right next to the stairs was a light switch that turned on the lights. But if you pressed gently on the wall right above it, the door unlatched and swung inward. It had me grinning, too. We all moved in. The kids were losing energy after moving things into the bedroom and unpacking boxes. But still, everyone wanted to see the start of Alina's life. Even Carolyn followed, though I think it was more boredom than any real level of interest. Besides, maybe there would be a mouse to chase. On the far wall, a divot in the floor sat waiting. They'd torn up the concrete there to expose the earth underneath. There was a low wall around it holding soil, with bags of fertilizers stored across the room. Water was set to drip in when moisture contents got too low, and alarms were set to Joe's phone if nutrients needed changing. It was an odd mix of high-tech and magic, since magic was about to be planted here. Yes, this is an excellent environment for my sister-daughter. She spun, fading away as we watched, then a minute later stepped back in holding a sapling. The stick of green had leaves and small branches, but it was only about as thick as two fingers put together, though half my height. She moved over to the calf-high wall and nestled the sapling in. Her hands moved dirt up and around it, like a mother tucking in a child for sleep. Water? Here. Joe handed her a small hose that was connected above the water sensor system and turned it on. Humming softly, she soaked everything down, then added a bit more dirt and dampened it. There, that should feed her. I don't think she'll wake, but would you like to see her? I glanced at everyone, but they looked as confused as I felt. See her how? She laughed, the sound of leaves in the trees. Ha 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 ha. Come, I will show you. With a wave of her hand, a door appeared, and she opened it to her glade. Why do you do doors? Everyone else does tears in reality. I asked as we followed her through. Her glade glittered in the diffused light. Even the leaves on the trees seemed to be sparkling with extra brightness. Hamadia rotated as she floated across her glade to her trees. Carolyn hasn't told you? I am not sure I know. I don't believe I have ever created a door. He said, ears flicking forward as he stalked over to a shady spot. Rips are either open or closed. With a door, the portal is there, but I can control who enters or exits. She had moved over to a set of three trees. One was huge, tall and straight. The other two were younger, both with large bowls in their trunks, about three feet off the ground. It almost looked like they had huge balls in the middle of them, but the wood was smooth, almost supple. That is both obvious and elegant. I need to remember to tell my Malkin. Carolyn sounded surprised, and I couldn't blame him. It was obvious, and I never thought about it. I'd have to see if I could create a door. This is me, or my essence. Hamadia laid a hand on the largest tree, obviously a deciduous, with bright green leaves just starting to turn orange. It held a position of importance in the glade. I was just beginning to see. Everything radiated out from this tree. I suspected if I could fly, I would see a spiral pattern to the glade. Either way, I couldn't ever remember seeing it before. This has always been hidden, hasn't it? Sable asked this as she walked up, arm in arm with Marisol, who looked around at everything with awe. If she'd ever been to a glade or pocket room before, I didn't know it. Yes, I do not share my true self with many. I can be harmed here. She just stated it as a fact, and I had to resist going over to hug her and promise her we never would. You know my queens would never do that. I choose queens well. Their family is honorable, too. 
Carolian's words helped cut the weight of those words. I know. That is why I am willing to share. This one here is Alina. She will wake soon. She touched the other tree. Himadia traced her hand over the bowl, and bark and flesh peeled away. Cradled in the tree was a little girl dryad. Her skin was supple green, like a new branch, her limbs still undefined, and her face oddly smooth. Another few months, and she'll feel the house around her. Her leaves will be the roof shingles pulling in the sun. Soon, she will wake with the sense of who she will be. I couldn't take my eyes off the child nestled in the tree. I turned and stared at Joe. Next time you decide you want kids, talk to Hamadia. That looks much more pleasant. The adults choked, and Joe grinned at me. Nah, this way, when they are bad, I can tell them to go talk to Mama Cory. Besides, you love them. Two sets of brown eyes peered up at me with wide eyes, the ketzos on their shoulders mimicking their actions. You do love us, Mama Cory. I moved over and kissed two tops of their heads. More than magic. It is mostly teasing your moms. They both cast me sideways looks, but Hamadia moved and pulled our attention away. This one will be my other sister daughter, Zelinka. The tree she stroked had thicker bark, and somehow it just seemed like a different tree. I was no expert on trees, but if I had to guess, I would have said Hamadia and now Alina were poplar trees, with vaguely heart-shaped leaves and silvery smooth bark. This tree looked different. Its bark was grooved with lines and leaves more fern-like and spread out, and already it looked like it would grow to be huge. Hamadia, is Zelinka different from you and Alina? Marisol asked as we moved to stare at the trees. The bowl where Alina lay had closed back up. She didn't open up the bowl where I assumed Zelinka was curled. Hamadia smiled. Yes, usually sister daughters are you, almost clones in your words. But if we try, we can either cross pollinate, our version of sex, or we can graft a child. The kids giggled a bit at sex, but dropped it at glares from the three of us. Oh, Marisol said, her face lighting up. I've been reading up on trees, like how you might put a pear branch into an apple tree. Yes, I believe so. This is a mixture. I took my seeds and traded with a dryad far from here. We merged and exchanged. I'd been hoping you would someday take over your tutor house. She stumbled a bit over the word tutor. It was such an odd word. It was so much bigger. I thought I would need a dryad who was strong and unique. Her hand caressed down the trunk, but this one didn't split open. She will be a dawn redwood. It should give her strength to guard the house for centuries. I made a quick mental note to look up what a dawn redwood was. You amaze me, Amadia, Sable said releasing Marisol's arms and walking over to her. Thank you for everything. Slowly, Sable reached out and offered a hug. Little leaves of green traced down Hamadia's arms, but she reached out just as slowly. I fought back tears as they hugged and couldn't believe how lucky I was with my life. Chapter 21 Calling on Merlins with strong spirit, specifically relativity. Task forces are being formed in all areas of the United States as emergency response units to close rips. Congress has passed an emergency budget to pay for these units. Everyone that joins will be paid a monthly stipend to reward their on-call status. For all responders that help to close a rift, a bounty will be paid. Contact RIPResponse at dmc.gov. Notice sent out to all the societies. Everything had been going so well the last few weeks that it felt odd. 
Tursane had offloaded magic onto the dragon pockets. No meetings had been called, no rips had appeared, and all the reports that had been created by the OMO were wrong. Life was good. Given the quiet, I felt like I could risk taking the time to pry information out of Salastra, but first I had to get her to talk to me. I'd pinged three or four times and got no response. I had the definite feeling she was avoiding me and I needed to figure out what her game was. She wasn't a friend, but she was more than an acquaintance. I do not know where Salastra lives. I have never had a reason to visit her. Malkin might. Carolyn said when I asked. It was early November, and we were already planning a huge Thanksgiving at the Tudor house. Joe, Sable, and the kids were going to move over there next weekend, and the dinner would be the first event held there. They had spent a fortune on the new furnishings and getting it ready, but they both were so excited it radiated from them. The twins went back and forth, especially since Hamadia couldn't or wouldn't plant Zelinka until winter solstice. Why that day, I didn't know, but she just shook her head. And until Zelinka was planted, there was no door between the houses. Granted, a half-mile walk wasn't that far, but when it was five degrees outside, that seemed like forever. It was Saturday, and everyone else was over at the Tudor house, tossing ideas out for the final week. Or the kids were, and Joe and Sable were trying to keep their wants somewhere in the realm of possibility. Carolee and I were lying in bed. I was reading a medical journal, leaning against him while he provided more heat than I needed. I can do that. I focused, then pinged Esmir. Evening, would you have an address or a location for Salstra? I need to talk to her. It could take a while for her to respond, so I picked up the magazine. No, she replied almost immediately. Well, I know her and we are... Friendly, I have never been to her glade, as you call it. There was something else lingering in her tone, but I couldn't figure out what. What else would I call it? And who would? I asked. Tursane, probably. Most of the senior lords interact. Or suppose you could ask Bob, but I wouldn't suggest that. I flinched and gagged at the same time, just thinking of how much it would hurt to speak with Bob. Saying, I think. You are coming over for Thanksgiving, right? Do you really think I would miss such a food extravaganza as that? Of course. Besides, I wish to see the new abode, and it has been too long since I've seen the children. Have they grown much? Too long? You saw them last week. Remember, human children grow slowly. Look how long it has been since they were born. In two years, Carolyn was almost this size, and they are almost seven. It amused me how fascinated the realm denizens were with the kids. They treated them both as miracles and the most amazing toy ever. Yes, but they still change. She responded vaguely, and I narrowed my eyes, but she couldn't see me. However, asked Tursane, this information I do not have and it is not mine to share. That I understood. Very well, all the love. I grinned as I said that. The amused humph just added to my humor. You do realize you confuse most of us. Carolyn stretched a bit, making me tilt to one side. I sank my fingers in and scratched. I sure do. That is half the fun. And you say Kath are sadistic. <laughs> he was laughing as he said it. It was only five in the afternoon. I'd ping Tursane and see if she would share, but the way Esmir had sounded made me think I was about to run into odd complications. I still knew there were cultural issues that I wasn't aware of. Oh well, the only way to find out was to do. Tursane, do you have a moment? I leaned my head back, enjoying the rumbling purr. Yes, Cory. I could almost see her snakes perk up just from her voice. Would you have time for Carolyn and me to come see you? There was a long pause. Come see me? Yes, unless you don't want us to. I mean, you can come here. The note of surprise in her voice made me blink. I'd been to Esmir's place, Smog's, Hemadia's, 
but I'd never been to Tursane's. A flush of sheer embarrassment rushed through me. It had always been my place. How could I have been so oblivious all these years? Some friend I was. I would love to come see you. Fifteen minutes? There was no way I was going to show up for the first time to Tursane's place and not bring a hostess gift. That would be nice. The bemused tone still hung in my mind, even as I was up and changing clothes. Come on, we are going visiting and I need a gift. I had two ideas in mind and would probably grab both. I grabbed my phone and called Joe. Joe, I'm headed over to see Tursane. Will be a while, probably. Sounds good. Pizza for dinner later? We're exhausted. Works for me, but don't wait if I'm not back by the time you need to eat. You know how it goes. Yep, you disappear for a hundred years, though, and I'm going to be annoyed. No way am I doing Christmas, dealing with family and the kids, Ketzos and Esmir all by myself. Laughter slipped out. <laughs> Promise, no disappearing for a hundred years. See ya, she said, and I heard the kids yelling, Pizza, pizza, in the background. I changed clothes into jeans and a soft t-shirt, braided my hair into a thick ponytail braid, then hit my present closet and grabbed what I had thought about. Then I headed to the memento room. Even after all that time, it stayed like a museum, but I was starting to think I needed to change that. What do you think, Garelian? Should I start to return these things? I was thinking we could make this into something for us both. He blinked up at me, still stretching as he walked. He would elongate, then catch back up with his head. It was rather amusing. That might be wise. There are many things in there that are precious, but the memory stones are yours. You have time now to learn the secrets they hold. But I would not give gifts as freely as you are. His voice was hesitant as he said that. He was right about the secrets. I'd almost forgotten about them. My mind always locked on the statues of the other heralds that had chosen poorly. I pushed open the door and stared at them. These I'd gladly get rid of, except I still didn't know what to do with them. They were people, or at least had been. I hated the idea of treating them like statues, even if they were. So they sat here, hidden warnings to me. I'd been through most of the memory or learning stones, but there were two that I just couldn't sink into. The way of thinking was too different. I doubted James had ever gone through them. He, in some ways, had been a hoarder. It just reminded me I needed to try to get rid of more stuff. Don't be silly. You give gifts when you go over to someone's house the first time. It's kind of rude not to. You think Tristan would like this one? I pointed to one that looked almost like sea glass. It had a slippery feel that reminded me of her snakes. The mind had been cold, large, and viewed the world as something to combat. There had been magic there, spirit magic, but it had seen everything as either food or obstacle, and I just couldn't do it. Of course, if it was a dragon, Smog would be annoyed, but it didn't feel like a dragon to me. Possibly... If nothing else, she might know better whose mind it was or is. There are beings out there that sleep for ages compared to your lifespans. He wandered through the room, tail twitching along the statues. He didn't seem to trust them any more than I did. I grabbed it and dropped it in my pocket. Ready? Yes. We headed to the sunroom to leave. It just seemed easier and not as rude to create doors in the house. I wasn't sure why I felt that way, but I did. Tursane? Location? I asked, as we didn't know where she was. An image of a pool by the water with a feeling of her magic came through. Carolian nodded and opened a rip. We stepped through to the scene in my mind. A blue sky with blue water burbling nearby. The ground white sand. Warmth caressed me. Hot enough I wanted to change to shorts. The light was the same as it had been in all the realms, the warmth diffusing over everything. I turned to see that we were in a courtyard. Ahead was a building made out of the same white stone as the rest of the area. The courtyard walls were about seven feet high, 
and covered with vines with heart-shaped leaves with small berries. Corey, come to my home. I finished turning to see Tersing curled around an odd chair with another chair near a table. The table had olives, cheese, and a craft of something clear. Your home is gorgeous. It never occurred to me that I'd never visited you, I said as I moved over toward her. Carolyn prowled along, nose and whiskers twitching. I must admit, I prefer to visit Earth. The warmth of the sun is oddly addictive. But please sit. She waved at the chair. Would you like to try grappa? That derailed my thoughts. Grappa? It is a human drink that was popular when my family was on Earth. I still enjoy it. She poured a small amount into the glass on the table in front of me, then some for herself. Derailed and curious, I sipped it. I blinked as the alcohol slammed into me. Whoa, <laughs> that is strong. Oh? She sipped and smiled, her obsidian teeth gleaming. I've always found it refreshing, though I do love your citrus drinks. She set the small crystal glass down. So, what is going on? That got me back on track. First, I wanted to bring you a hostess gift. I'm sorry that I never did before. I thought maybe you could use it in the council meetings. The snakes seem a bit cold at times. I reached into the day pack I'd grabbed and pulled out the gift, handing it to her. Surprised, she took it, something flickering across her face. She removed it from the small bag and opened up the six-foot emerald green silk scarf. All the snakes were peering around her head, hissing in excitement and delight. This is gorgeous, she said slowly. There was a tone under there I couldn't understand. How would I wear this? Oh, here, may I? I stood at her nod and took the scarf from her. Then I wrapped it loosely around her head, the snakes tucked underneath, but able to slip out if they so desired. See? She uncoiled from the stool and went to peer at herself in the water and smiled. That is lovely. I never thought about it, but it would explain why they are much more sluggish and love when I wear one of the hoodies you gave me. Hoodies had become a standard gift, Though personally, I still thought the sheer one Sable had found last year was hilarious. Tersane had laughed and immediately put it on, much to most of the men's consternation. Good. Here, I also brought you this. I'm not sure what it is, but I thought maybe you would enjoy it more than me. I pulled out the glass stone and handed it to her. There was the oddest wince, but she took it with a smile. Oh. Her eyes got wide as they unfocused. Her snakes writhed, but I couldn't tell if it was happy or sad writhing. After what seemed forever, I'd even dared to take another sip of grappa. She focused back on me. Where did you get this? No clue. It was in the memento room James had. There are all sorts of things in there. Honestly, most of the time we forget about it, even though the door is right there. It was almost like half the time it didn't want to be found. Ah... This is impressive, and I have no idea how he got it. I am almost more impressed it exists. Her eyes narrowed, but she didn't follow up on whatever thought that was. It is the memory stone of a great serpent. There are only a few that I even know of. I wonder what he had to trade in to get this. I'm not sure, but if I ever find it in his journals, I'll tell you. Terse nodded and picked up her glass, watching me. Two snake heads peeking out of the scarf, flicking their tongues at me. The silence carried for a minute, and for the first time in a long time, I felt off balance. I wanted to see if I could get Celestra's address from you. Ah, and what are you willing to pay for that information? Huh? I stared at her, completely lost. Pay? Pay for what? Chapter 22 Do you want to be a mage? 
Is your window for emerging disappearing? Contact Mage Creators for help. Our specially trained archmages will stimulate your body's neurons to help you to emerge as a mage and raise your potential to the stratosphere. All rights reserved. Results are not guaranteed, and this advertisement does not constitute a legally binding agreement. Made Creators Add Realization flickered across her face, and she took another sip. Corey, how many things have you ever asked of us denizens? I blinked, confused by her question. Asked how? Help? Assistance? Favors? Her face was serene as she asked me, but two more snakes snuck out, staring at me. Oh, um, I thought. I don't know that I've tracked the number of things. I know I've asked things of Georgas, I guess. Banyarl, a little. Carolian, of course. Esmir, I guess. I mean, I talked to you and the others in councils. Why? Tersane nodded slowly and twisted the crystal glass in her hand, the light sparkling off of it. You know... We don't use money, correct? Sure. I picked up one of the olives and ate it, trying to give myself something to concentrate on. We deal in favors, trades, items. Jorgas, as he was your master's familiar, is exempt. James wasn't my master, I blurted, in any sense of the word. Tersane chuckled a bit. (laughs) But he left you his property and his magical items. As far as magic is concerned, he was the master, and you were the apprentice. I frowned at that, but didn't interrupt. Which means you can ask anything of Georgas without needing to pay for it. Esmir is your familiar's mother. While she could have required payment for any favors, she had the freedom to choose not to. I stared at her, completely lost. You mean anything I ask for has to be paid for? Tersane shrugged. Yes and no. If you ask me to pour you more grappa, no. She waved at the grappa. If you asked me for a bottle to take home, yes. I nodded slowly, thinking. What about Banyarl? He was your teacher. Something he agreed to as a favor to Esmir. Did you ever ask her what that cost? It never occurred to me. I looked at Carolian. You knew, didn't you, about all of this? Of course. It was why I often did the communication. You asking questions about things you had been tasked with would not generate a cost. You asking for something else. I avoided you needing to. My eyes widened. What did it cost you? Images of him being flayed alive slammed into my mind and heart. A soft chuckle. (laughs) Nothing I had an issue paying. The cost isn't always great. I reached out to touch him. The idea of him being hurt for my stupidity made me crave the feel of him. Okay, what do you want? Her smile had a tinge of sadness to it, and the snakes pulled back. If I had realized how much you still applied human culture to our actions... She sighed, letting the thought fade away. (sighs) In the future, as much as I adore your generosity, come and ask, then offer the scarf, the gift. I've been able to participate in your Christmas traditions as they tend to be exchanges. As it is, most don't know what to make of you. You give so freely. I should have told you sooner, but I had thought Esmir would have. Why didn't she? She assumed I would or had. Carolian laid his head down on his paws. I didn't want you to change, to become someone that put a price on everything. Besides, most of it was magic-driven, so you didn't have to pay a price. You are the herald. There is more leeway for you than most. Future goodwill drives a lot of actions. He had his eyes closed and wouldn't look at me. I sighed, but kept petting him. (sighs) 
what you were saying is that if I had asked the question and then offered the gift that I wanted to give you regardless, it would have been a fair trade? More than, but you gave without asking, which I still find amazing, but it is what it is. You don't give things away for free. I thought back to the price Smog agreed to. At the time, I assumed it was politicking, future favors trying to keep things on the same level, not an actual price. So Salstra and Bob both paid you for the magic you dumped in their realms? Yes, handsomely. She took another sip of grappa. Salestra is supplying hair from her mane and tail to a weaver group of Jetarians for a bedspread for me. It will take two years for her to shed that much. Bob will work with me to create some new spaces. Chaos works better than spirit to pull magic into new and unusual forms that are livable. Ah. It felt wrong to pay for something. Something that I would have given freely. But I'd learned the hard way that this was their culture, and my assumptions didn't work here. The horn on my arm reminded me every time. Then, what would you like for the request? Tersane smiled. It was a bit sad, yet humor lingered at the edges. I still owe you three favors. They would garner you almost anything from me. I glanced down at the snake on my arm and shook my head before I finished thinking about it. No, those... I... I looked up at her, biting my lip. I would prefer to never use them, but if I must, it would be for something I have no other way to pay for. Terse nodded, her snakes hissing in what I thought was delight. That is a wise choice. Normally, you state what you are willing to pay, but for this time... She trailed off, looking thoughtful. This courtyard is new and still barren. Do you have any statues you might not want? I blinked rapidly and then glared at Kirlian. Do you want... His tail whapped me hard, and I stuttered to a stop. I'd been about to offer all three. Too much for this simple ask. I happen to have some statues I have no need for. Would you be interested in one of them? A slow smile started at the edge of her face. Why, yes, I believe I would. How about the arrogant male? That can be arranged. Do you need it now, or may I finish my business with Salestra first? It felt like an elaborate game, but at the same time, it almost made sense to me and gave me clues as to the other issues the counselors were having with us, and us with them. I trust you greatly. Let me know when you are ready to deliver him. My eyebrows rose at the pronoun, but I didn't say anything about that. I'm honored by your trust. It has been well earned. Her smile was broader now. I will gladly provide her location. Would you like me to let her know you are coming? Since I didn't actually know Selstra, for all that she seemed to be more intimately involved in my life than I would have preferred, I never dared to ping her. Which would be the wiser option? I was pretty sure that didn't require a trade, as I was asking her opinion, not for something, I hoped. She tilted her head, the snakes slipping out and hissing. It depends... If you wish to fight your way through and prove to her you should not be trifled with, then don't. If you think letting her believe she is the one that has something you want, then I would let her know. More grappa. I shook my head as she poured herself more. If I drank what was still in my glass, I was pretty sure I'd be drunk. The stuff had to be at least a hundred proof. Carolyn? I whispered to him. There were advantages in both ways. He hesitated for a minute. Tersane, does Salestra have contempt for Cory? Cory? Specifically? No. Cory is an interesting tool, though I do not know how she plans on using her. Tersane nodded at my left arm and the tattoos there. 
There were days when I wondered how long it would be until I had a neck tattoo, which I didn't want at all. Don't tell her. Let Corey prove she is not a pawn in their games. I suspect the council will figure that out soon enough. Carolyn mentally smirked as he said that. If only I had as much faith in myself as he had in me. Very well. Here is her address. A mental impression. A taste of magic. That will work. Corey, I do have an idea about this, but you need to address her from a position of power. Caroline was sitting up, staring at the featureless sky as he spoke. He could navigate by the impressions, something I never heard of a human being able to do. And how do I do that? This was almost worse than China. Knowing Salastra, she has defenses. Go through them without damaging, but making it clear that she couldn't stop you if she wanted to. I cast her saying a look. So this sort of advice you can give? Of course. It might be wrong. I might be lying. It could just be speculation. Now, if you had asked me to tell you all the defenses around her place, that would cost you. A sigh escaped. Uh, it seems awfully variable. No better or worse than how relationships work around your world. Carolyn won't let you be steered wrong. And, thinking about it, you haven't needed to know this until now. Every other interaction has been as a friend trying to help, not someone trying to do something. And you gave Smog a gift she will never forget— so she pretends everything is part of what she owes you. Oh, that made a lot of things clearer, and I could see that returning her son to her, if I had asked for a boon, would have been enormous. Is it insulting to say I prefer you better as a friend, not someone dealing with the Herald? No, I take that as a compliment, and will do my best to stay as a friend. I rose, ready to talk to Salstra. What did Frey cost you? Tersane waved her hand. It cleared up an old debt that Frey owed me. I had it for decades and never used it. It was nice to get rid of it. All the questions Esmir and Tersane had asked for me, the favors and exchanges they had done for me, without ever letting me realize there was a price— all this time, I'd thought it was like going to the library, or maybe talking to the wise man in villages. I owed them so very much. Tersane had risen, too, as I stood. I smiled and moved over, hugging her tight. She stiffened, then relaxed in the hug, the snakes giving me soft lick kisses. Thank you for everything, I whispered then released her and stepped back. A flush covered her upper body, but a smile graced her face. May magic be with you, she said. Carolyn opened the rip to Salstra's, and we left the warmth and comfort of Tersane's home. Given that Salstra was a horse, I'd expected wide plains, grass, gently rolling hills. That wasn't what I walked into a grove of tightly packed trees with a single path leading toward a mountain. Or at least I assumed it did, as I couldn't see through the trees, but the mountain rose high over them. The path was the obvious route, and I couldn't see any other means. The trees were so close together, even Carolyn couldn't slip through. Should have made you wear your harness. Next time we go anywhere in the realms, you are going to be loaded. We can go get it. I tilted my head and thought. No, she knows we're here. Let's go. Smart queen. Jerk. Your jerk. <laughs> Always, I said with a laugh and stepped onto the path, only to have my foot sink in as if it was quicksand. I barely hesitated, calling earth and having my footing solidify. Ten more steps in... Spiders dropped down around us, casting webs. A little fire took care of that, and they scattered, though I was careful to not actually burn them, 
just their webs. Is it going to be like this the whole way? I peered at Carolian, who paced a step ahead of me. This is probably easy stuff, meant to warn people away. Well, you told me to blow through her defenses. Might as well. Try not to kill anything. Often they are fulfilling favors or debts as well. Great. I get to prove I can move past her magic and yet not harm anyone. You'd better hope all my studying has paid off. I stared at the forest that watched me back, though with more curiosity than malice. You are a true queen, powerful and smart. You will be fine. The faith of a cath. What more could I ask for? With that thought, I started down the path. Chapter 23 the rips are a sign that man was never meant to use magic. We don't use it correctly, and soon all of us will pay the price. Give up magic now. Shear your heads, cut off your nails, and turn your back on the addiction magic is. Otherwise, our world shall surely perish due to our own selfishness. Freedom from Magic The woods around us creaked and I stopped to listen. I loved the mountains and forest on Earth, walking through them, listening to the movement of creatures, their sounds, the feel of the air against my face, even the sharp scent of pine. Here, it was different. There was no breeze to speak of. There were scents, but they seemed to be pale copies, lacking something that most plants on Earth had, and it watched me. At home, occasionally animals would stop and watch us, Carolian usually, but here, the woods measured my every step. I wish I knew how she did that. Leaves started to drop from the trees and fly toward me. I ducked and one cut into a branch above me. Ah, getting a bit aggressive, aren't you? I pulled out Air, who thought this was great fun fighting her sisters, and created a wall of wind whirling around me. Air cut the leaves and flung them back, though not as hard as they could have. After a few minutes, the leaves faded away, and we continued. This is both too easy and too basic. She is an order lord. Why is everything easily countered by elements? I was talking to myself as much as Carolian. She enjoys the long game, and this gives her much information. Be strategic about how you respond. It is meant to deter, but also inform. I pondered that a few more steps, then shrieked in surprise as a wall of earth began to form around us. Each brick was three times the size of my hand. They snapped in place, quickly until it was fifteen feet high. After staring at it a minute, there were so many options to take it down. I pulled on Call Mineral and separated out every mineral in the wall into different piles. The bricks crumbled as the various minerals piled up. When there was barely a framework of carbon left, I raked my hands through it, and it crumbled into dust. That had been fun. The offerings weren't much, and honestly, I wouldn't mind a bit more as my hair was so freaking long lately. I needed to cut it. With Carolian, I could use it even cut, and otherwise, the headaches were becoming a pain. Still, the path led on, but a gap in the trees to the right gave me a hint of what was next. Ambush coming up, Carolian whispered in my mind. I sent back an affirmative response to show I'd hurt him, but didn't slow down. A flash of tawny fur and a roar had me diving forward and turning as a manticore pounced. The dark mane filled my vision as Carolian snarled a warning. I had a feeling his advice to not cause harm didn't apply to him. Four pale strips down on the wing grabbed my attention. Mikal? I yelled, half in surprise, half because I really didn't want Carolian to kill him. The manticore jerked to a halt and peered down at me. I know you. Maybe not know me, but Carolian put those scars down your wing. I pointed to his wing and the pale strips where Carolian had healed him. 
a twist of that huge leonine head to look at the calf about to slice his throat. Play, I remember. He sat back and shook his head, and it was almost like a persona fell away or slid on. Sorry, what are you doing here? Do you have a pass? Carolian snarled, but backed down, licking his claws with a decidedly annoyed air about him. Pass? No, I need to see Salastra, and I think she is avoiding me. I looked him up and down. He'd grown a lot in the last few years. Definitely not a kid anymore. What are you doing here? I owed Salastra a favor, so I patrol here. It was my shift. His mental voice sounded amused, and I decided not to follow up on what he meant. I see. How do we get past you? I asked as I slowly stood up and brushed the dirt off my clothes. Normally, you would have to defeat me. But in this case, I still owe Carolian for healing me. He did not have to. I looked at Carolian, but he ignored me. So, you may continue. You won't get in trouble? No. It is my job to ensure only those worthy to see her get through. I declare you worthy. A chuckle escaped. (laughs) I see. Can you tell me what I need to do to deal with the head? I am unaware. This is my area. I patrol until my shift ends, (laughs) then go home. When does it end? I think another year by your time. I should go. Be well, Harold. He rose up to his full height and shook his body and disappeared into the trees. This might be harder than it looked. You need to impress. Right now, you have just proved you are not easily dissuaded. He stretched out, yawning. Though I really do need to start hunting bigger prey. My reaction times are too slow. There was nothing I could say to that. From my point of view, his reactions were lightning fast. But I wasn't him. Made it this far... Might as well keep going. The forest faded away as we walked, and we found ourselves facing a large chasm with a river way too far below. There was a bridge stretching over it just wide enough for a single person. A balance test? That didn't make sense, so I moved closer as the color of the bridge changed. What? I moved until I could crouch next to the bridge, and I watched it. It went from granite, to lace, to concrete, to paper, to something else. The pattern was the same. Strong enough to support, probably strong enough, not strong enough. I timed it, eight seconds for each section. The bridge was about 300 feet across. Carolian could possibly make it. I didn't have a chance. The river was a very long way down, and while I could probably survive the fall with the assistance of air, I would have failed. Transformation. That was normally Joe's strongest skill, but I had it strong too. Here goes nothing. I reached out with my magic and willed it to turn to steel. For a second, it started to change, then flipped back to paper. I offered up more to create steel and held it there, forcing the molecules into the patterns that I wanted. They fought me, trying to twist to other patterns, but I still held, until a wave of strength wrested it from me and it changed to glass, then teased me with steel. We fought trying to change it to the product I wanted, steel, stone, rope, plastic. The longest I could hold any of it was 12 seconds, but that was 12 seconds with me doing nothing but concentrating, Sweat dripped off my forehead as I sagged back. I could create a volcano in between the chasm, but that might qualify as overkill. How did I breeze past something that was a skill she'd probably practiced for centuries? The point of this was to show how easily I could beat her at magic, not exhaust myself trying to match her offering for offering. I looked around. There was no way I could compete with a magic user that had been using Transform for centuries. It also meant she was aware of what I was doing and having great fun blocking me. 
I stood up and stared at the chasm. It was much too far to leap, and the point was to breeze by as if her magic didn't even cause me any effort to bypass, which was not what I was doing right now. The shimmer of light way below was hypnotic as I stood there. Light. Got it. I let my shoulders down from where I'd had them scrunched up. Ready, Carolyn? I know how to do this, but we still shouldn't dawdle. He rose up from the ground. Yes, but how are we crossing? I pulled on water. It rushed up from the river far below, at first a trickle, then a solid stream, and I sent it over the arch. Then I froze it. Water wasn't happy about having its rushing around slowed down, but it still froze into a hard bridge, six inches thick, solidly clamped into each side. Ready? I asked with a grin. We fall, I will never let you live it down. I know, and I deserve it, but I got this. My assurance didn't stop me from having air ready to catch me or a sidestep to the house in the back of my mind, ready to be called to the front. He sniffed at me, then sprang forward, moving fast, his claws digging in at each bound. I held my breath as it shook, but it didn't break. He was across in less than 15 seconds. Now it was my turn. I didn't run. Slipping would ensure I failed. The surface of the ice bridge was rough as air scored it and drops of water ran off. My heart triple thumped as I realized Salastro was using air to melt the bridge. I just kept moving. I transformed the top layer into grippy clay, my foot sticking a bit with each step. The air around me heated. I should have created the bridge rather than transformed it, but water was chaos, not order. She had to work a bit harder with it than the elements that were in her branch. But that didn't mean she couldn't. I would move a bit faster. It is getting thinner. Falling would make this a very bad day. Cracks sounded behind me, and I felt it wobble. I moved faster. I'd already been out here for over a minute. Way too much time when you were up against a mage of Salstra's caliber and experience. Ten steps... I reached, offering up a chunk of hair to turn the entire bridge to rope and wood. I had to stop to do that. The bridge swayed under me as it changed. Then it was solid. The air cooled, and I could feel her reassessing. I ran the last few steps, hitting the solid ground on the other side as the rope started to change into strands of spiderweb. Still strong, but not strong enough to hold me. I didn't know you had that level of risk in you, Carolyn teased. I prefer not to put my life on the line just to talk to someone. Someone that is starting to piss me off. What if Salastra wanted to talk to that person? As if in response to my words, a bridge of white marble formed, ancient and steadfast, offering me a way back across. What was it with bridges in the realms? I rolled my eyes and started walking. The trees had faded into the background as the mountain rose up. The trees that remained were oaks, elms, and poplar trees. The realms didn't seem to care about what grew together. The mountain wasn't as big as I thought, much more the size of the stutter butts instead of the Rockies. At the base was a grove of trees. The weather was perfect as always, and if I hadn't been so annoyed... It might have been a nice walk. The grove opened to reveal a glade with lush, green grass, dozens of fluffy rabbit-like creatures, and an opening into the mountain, where I could just glimpse what looked like bedding. Over to one side was a fountain providing crystal-clear water that tinkled as it fell into a basin. All of these were the surrounding details to the unicorn that stood to one side, watching us, a huge mirror hung from a tree next to her. Her pearly silver horn and hooves gleamed, and her coat of white looked like someone had just brushed it. The flexible lips lifted up and sneered at me, revealing long fangs. Harold! The crystal sharp tone sliced into my mind. I crossed my arms and glared at her. 
Are you really this big of a bitch, or do you just want people to think you are? Chapter 24 The Merlin Wonder Child recently finished her draft. Given her notoriously private attitude, it is a bit of surprise to find she has been spied at the closing of various rips. Is she working for the government? This would be an odd turn of events, but what is even more odd is finding Stephen Alexen involved. He was rumored to be involved with her emergence as a double Merlin. We all know the rips are terrifying, but is something more going on? Magical Daily News The wind stopped. Everything stopped. Then she chuckled in my mind. Her voice always felt too sharp, too orderly. I had the feeling she could moderate it, but chose to speak like that because she knew it caused discomfort. You don't fear me, do you? No, because I still owe you and you'd never damage me until all my debts are paid. I snapped back. I had forgotten how cranky her voice could make me. She snorted a very horsey sound. <laughs> also truth. So why are you here? She lowered the volume of her voice, or dialed down the intensity, and it didn't hurt as badly. Maybe I'd get my answers before I started to bleed from my ears. Why did you call in a debt and require me to accept the position of counselor? What do you gain from it? My arms were crossed, and I stared at her. Carolyn stood next to me. The fact that he hadn't flopped down somewhere told me this wasn't a safe place. That was what I chose to do. Should you not be grateful I asked for so little? She turned her head to peer at me with one eye, the horn glinting with menace. It wasn't little. It puts me in odd situations. Why did you want me there? Are all humans so boring? I have things to do if you are done. She turned, flicking her tail at me as she headed inside, and stopped at the water basin. It was obvious she wasn't going to answer my question. What is Brix's problem? That bird hates humans. The hate has been there for a very long time. Do not expect that hate to fade. The fact that she answered me surprised me. Is Brix my enemy? Enemy? Odd word. That implies you are important to him. She walked back out, tail swishing slowly, and strode past us. Are you? How would I know? I've met Brix, what, three times? Maybe four. What is the council playing at? I turned to watch her. We are not playing at anything. We are swimming in the currents magic is sending to us, trying to survive. Brix just has more experience than most. Salstra moved toward the white fluffs. They moved around nervously, but none of them left the glade area. What do you mean Brix has more experience? I pivoted slowly, making sure my back was never to her. Brix has been on the council for at least 500 of your years. I believe magic was still on your earth when Brix was hatched. It was said idly, at the same time, she darted forward, a fast move that made me flinch. Her horn impaled one of the fluffs. It screamed a high sound like nails on a chalkboard. Red blood wound down her horn as it hung impaled. With another fast movement, Salstra lowered her head, then flipped it up fast, the fluff sliding off her horn and into the air. She caught the falling body in her mouth and chewed a few times before swallowing. I, too, love these. Just the perfect snack size, but four or five can easily make a meal. I swallowed, more because it was so odd to see something that looked and felt like a horse be a predator. So you aren't going to tell me anything? My exasperation leaked through, and I tried to scale it back. I have told you many things. 
If you are wise, you will be a good counselor. If not, well, there are very many humans. I am sure a replacement will be found. Gee, thanks, I muttered. Can you tell me what the rise of magic means? It doesn't make sense. Even if Tursane is siphoning magic from humans, there aren't that many that would qualify. I would think the Herald of Magic is the one to answer that question. She didn't even deign to look at me as she eyed the fluffs that were scattering back and forth. Carolian, I asked, a bit desperate. I'd hoped she'd tell me something, explain why it had to be me. I knew I'd been railroaded into this, but I still didn't know why. What do you believe the Herald of Magic is supposed to do? How does she serve magic? His words were sharper and clearer than I'd ever heard them, almost painful and unable to be ignored. For a minute, he sounded like Esmir. Watch it, Keth. I have no issue killing you, Salstra said. I welcome you to try. I haven't had horse in a long time. He fired back. What is it with all of you and your constant threats? I'd meant the words to stay in my mind, but my mouth opened before my brain caught up, the frustration and exasperation making them shriller than they should have been. They both looked at me surprised. Does she truly not understand? Carolian cocked an ear at me. Then they both laid back against his skull as if annoyed and ashamed. I thought she had figured it out, but it looks like she is not. Salstra cocked an ear at me, then heaved a sigh. (sighs) We are predators, and we are crossing into each other's territory all the time. If we were animals, we would hiss and posture and even attack, both mock and real. However, we are not animals, so... We threaten, put down, demean. It is our posturing to remind everyone, including ourselves, that we are not killing the other only because we choose not to. She paused to spear, toss, and chew another fluff. And it is rather amusing. Esmir is very skilled at her put-downs. I felt a wave of heat crawl up my face as I flushed, The explanation was obvious once said and highlighted the issues humans were having. We didn't do that. When you stood up to me at the beginning of this conversation, you weren't posturing, were you? Salstra had turned and peered at me out of a large, dark eye. Why would I posture? I'm not a predator, and I don't have anything to prove. They both just looked at me disbelief clear on their faces. Humans are the most efficient and violent of all species, Carolan said, still staring at me. They kill just to kill. And you don't? I shot back. I'd seen him play with enough of his toys to have zero patience with his line of thinking. And while humans may be, I'm not. I don't go around killing people and I don't need to prove... I trailed off. Let me rephrase that. If I need to prove I'm dangerous, I will. But no, I wasn't trying to posture to you, Salstra. I'm just trying to figure out what is going on. I stood there, jaw clenched, arms crossed, feeling vaguely betrayed by Carolian. Answer the question, Salstra. He walked over to me and rubbed against me. I stumbled a bit as he rumbled against me. I thought you understood our interactions. Sometimes you joined in, and all the years I have been blessed by magic with your presence. I was unaware you still thought those words communicated dislike. My arms dropped, and I reached for him. Have you ever heard me or the others talk like that? Of course. I craned my head down to stare at him. What? Joe will tease you and Sable, well, prior to the children by calling you bitch. Sanchez and his brothers call each other names all the time. You called him stinky until recently. How is this any different? His purrs didn't stop, 
and I let my hand idly scratch his head while I reassessed everything. He was right. We did do that. I just hadn't equated that to threatening to kill each other or eat them. Someday I will have all the cultural stuff figured out. I wanted to scream. I glanced at Salstra. Would it have been better if I came in here breathing fire and told you I was going to have unicorn steak for dinner if you didn't talk? It would have been more amusing and made me respect you more. You humans are so polite, always asking permission and trying not to offend. You are seen as weak. If you were not the Herald, I would have just killed you a long time ago, though perhaps that might have been a mistake. A horrid thought struck me. None of the counselors or other denizens had anything to do with Hisahito's heart attack, did they? Why would we bother? He was the worst, always so deferential. It will be a relief to have someone else there to talk to. Of all of them, the one you call Shay has the most backbone. But even he is so mild. She shook her head, drops of blood flying from her horn and spattering her silver coat. I see. It remained to be seen if I was relieved or not. What about Carolyn's question? She huffed and walked away from us, lashing her tail back and forth. I do not understand why your focus isn't a canine. They hold onto bones like you hold onto questions. We need the Herald to stop what is going on in the realms. The magic leaking out is merely a symptom. We expect the Herald to serve magic... But what magic demands, we don't know. She doesn't speak to us like we do to you. She creates opportunities for you to act, for you to solve what is happening. She took a drink of water from her basin, it tinting pink as the blood sluiced off her muscle. The realms are fracturing? It seems that way. None of us know what is going on. But per the stories, the last time this happened... Merlin did something, and we had been stable until now. Every herald has always had something magic needed them to do. I grabbed onto that with both hands. Merlin did something? What did he do? Here, finally, was a clue. Something that would tell me what I could do or should do. A guidebook. Unknown. That was a very long time ago. Bricks may know... Or, if you can find someone else that was alive and involved then, but that is why you are the Herald, so that you can take what magic is presenting to you. She turned to look at me, the blood gone, leaving her coated in white and silver, perfectly pure, virginal, and deadly. Why couldn't you just say that? I wanted to scream. If I'd known this from the beginning... Maybe I'd have more information now. Because that is not our job. You are the Herald. It is your problem. I just stared at her. I'm not posturing when I say this, but right now, the idea of a unicorn rug is very appealing. She bared her fangs back at me. Try it. I enjoy the taste of mage flesh. The comment was so Carolian-like that I couldn't help it. I laughed. She just stared at me, blinking. Fine, I get it. Magic will show me. The council just expects me to figure it out. Or die. Both are valid options. I narrowed my eyes, then shrugged. Uh, we all die. Hopefully I won't until I am old and ready to go. Any last words? Be the herald and quit being so drearily human. There was so much to unwrap in that, and I would. Later. Carolian, it would have been polite to walk away. I was done being polite. He opened a rip, and we stepped home with the snickering of a homicidal horse bubbling in my mind. I had such a headache. Chapter 25 Anyone else responding to the request for magical response teams? I don't mind closing rips, but they want teams. I get the feeling more is going on than what we're being told. Why isn't this in the news more besides an occasional mention? 
Does anyone else have any more information? What exactly is happening and how bad is it really? Initial post of a 2000 response string on the House of Emrys forums. Thanksgiving had been delightful, but I hated that I was now viewing all interactions with denizens through a new lens. It didn't change anything, but it did make me think harder about the interactions that I watched. Christmas was at the end of the month, but Carolyn had been being very helpful lately. We'd had a long talk, and for him, understanding how to interact with the denizens was like a cat learning how to use a litter box. Absolutely obvious. It never occurred to him I was behaving the way I did out of ignorance. He'd honestly thought I just enjoyed tweaking their tails, which, in hindsight, I had been. I just didn't realize what else they were gathering from it. The next council session was scheduled for after the first of the year. At that point, we would see just how much three humans could do. But now I had given in, with mock reluctance, and gotten Carolyn his deep-sea fishing trip. Joe and Sable had both wrinkled their noses. Sable apparently got seasick, and Joe thought managing two six-year-olds on a fishing boat sounded like a fast way to needing to be sedated. But Stephen, Indira, and Charles said they wanted to go. I'd scheduled it out of Charleston, and Carolyn had been pestering me all week about what types of fish we might get. He had mental wish lists and recipes that didn't quit. I'm sure you will get something. Just don't count on any specific fish. I'd warned. He'd shrugged and ignored me. After much discussion, Stephen and Indira decided to do a road trip down, making it a nice break for them. They'd let Carolyn know where they were and he'd transport Charles. Then I'd sidestep over to him. The normal chaos ensued with travel, meeting at the dock, then getting on board. I'd found a life jacket for Carolyn, and he'd agreed to wear it with resistance. If I fall in the water, I will just open a rip to the crossroads and step out. And if you're unconscious? I stared at him. His ears tilted back, but he'd relented. The captain, Jacob Sauls, treated Carolyn just like a person— and only blinked once when he'd come on board. The first mate was a woman with large blue eyes and blood-red hair. Jacob introduced her as Siobhan. Jacob got us all situated, and soon enough, we were sailing out of the Charleston Harbor. Thank you for inviting us. This is just the change of pace I needed. Indira leaned against the railing with me, her hair wrapped in a tight bun under her cap. Even dressed in jeans, a sweater, and windbreaker, she still looked rather stylish. I'd never figure it out. I'm glad you two could come. It makes it more fun, and I have a feeling we are going to have a lot of fish. I looked over at the three males all being educated about how the fishing rods worked and anchoring themselves. Charles and Stephen were paying close attention while Carolyn listened, but his ears kept twitching toward the ocean I couldn't remember ever seeing him this excited. That, I believe. You did get something to store it in. Indira asked. I've been looking at recipes, but still, there is a limit as to how much room there is in the freezer. I laughed. (laughs) Yeah, I cheated. Himadia says she can create a large null space for us to dump the fish into, and basically it is kept perfectly frozen. Indira slid her eyes to me. She can create pockets into outer space? There was hunger for knowledge in her tone, and I smirked, as I knew that hunger all too well. Not exactly. She said it was more of not space, something in between our realities, so it has no temperature. It is more of a stasis. It is one of the many things I want to investigate when I can. The wind pulled tendrils of hair out of my braids and shoved them into my mouth. Huh. I envy you sometimes. Family, friends, and so much opportunity to research. There was a certain wistfulness to her words, and I peered at her, concerned. Before I could say anything, Captain Jacob yelled out, Okay, let's bait these and see what we can catch. Excitement almost poured off the four of them by the stern, 
And by silent agreement, Indira and I moved over to watch. There were comfortable chairs back away from the action. We settled into them with bottles of water and got ready for the show. Charles was fastened into a chair and let the line go. Erichina had declined to come, preferring her food still mostly alive, and the idea of that much water when floating had sealed her decision. I missed her, but at least Indira was here. Carolyn wrapped his hands, his claws firmly retracted, around the shaft of the fishing pole and leaned over it, ears forward and tail tight against him. No one wanted that tail to get caught in anything. The poles bent and jumped around as the hooks and floats bobbed up and down in the waves we created as we cut across the choppy ocean. The silver line flashed in the December sun, and Carolyn rumbled in purrs as he watched it spin. I think you have one. Start reeling it in. Jacob pointed when Carolyn's line was jumping up and down. Carolyn started to pull it back, fighting with the line. He was stronger than I was, but the circular motion wasn't one he used often. Even so, soon he was bringing a wriggling fish to the surface while Captain Jacob helped Charles with another fish on his line. I have a fish. This is excellent. No waiting or lurking. They come to you and you simply reel them in. Carolyn's gloating excitement had Indira and me snickering. The pulling back and forth of the fishing pole as he fought to reel in the first fish almost pulled him out of the boat once or twice. The harness that clipped him in prevented any unexpected swimming lessons. Then the line snapped, throwing him backwards. Hey, you okay? There was a tinge of worry in the captain's voice as he approached Carolyn. This is excellent. Again, show me how. You ain't upset or nothing? Of course, but prey slips through all the time. That is the joy of the hunt. Now again. Carolyn handed him the fishing rod. I have much prey to capture today. The captain shook his head and showed him. Carolyn didn't quite have the manual dexterity to tie the hooks on, so the captain did that, though he had no issue threading the bait fish on the hook, then casting it back in. Stephen, meanwhile, had pulled in a fish not much bigger than his arm and was unhooking it to toss it back. While we were taking a bunch of them home, the smaller ones got tossed back in. Charles had a wide grin on his face as the water splashed and his rod bent, pulling and bucking with it. I might have created monsters, I said in a soft tone to Indira. I do believe you are correct. Oh well, there are worse things for them to find exciting, but I see many more of these in my future. She had a fond grin on her face as she watched Stephen live in the moment, something I'd rarely seen. I chuckled. (laughs) I hope everyone else likes fish. We are going to have it as a staple for a while, though it might make an excellent party offering, as I know many of the denizens regard it as a delicacy. I've never gotten them to tell me why they find it such a treat when I know they have oceans and rivers. We watch them fight with fish and sometimes win, sometimes lose. Carolyn purred so loud I could hear him over the rumble of the boat engine and the wind, The entire thing exhilarated him. So far, we had caught a few mahi-mahi, wahoo, tuna, and a king mackerel. The other two men had given up, with wind-burned faces and smiles of delight, but Carolyn was wrestling with a marlin. Every time it leapt up in the air, its sharp, pointy nose slicing through the air, Carolyn screamed. It was a high, sharp sound that was meant to freeze a prey in terror, The first time everyone on the ship jumped, and Siobhan stuck her head out of the bridge, eyes wide. Carolyn ignored all of us, lost in the thrill of the chase. It was so odd to see him in a harness and life jacket, pulling back on a fishing rod, trying to reel it in. The motions were jerky and awkward compared to humans, but he didn't care. Look at this. This is prey worthy of the fight. He all but crowed in my head, even if I need to use tools to bring it close. Captain Jacob just grinned. He'd make a fine fisherman. 
I smothered a snort. <laughs> uh, not if you wanted the catch to make it back to shore. I can guarantee you it will be munched on. He gave me an appraising look. Ah, I am thinking perhaps I should start to prep some of the catch prior to returning to port. I smiled. That might be what? I broke off as pain slashed through my brain. Indira flinched too, and we both looked around. You felt that? I asked as I scanned the sky. Yes, it was large. Are the rips starting back up again? Indira scanned the sky like I did, looking for anything. I don't know. I have no idea how long this piece might last. I had hoped longer than this. I kept turning slowly, trying to see something, but out here on the ocean, everything was so huge and empty it was hard to tell. Is something wrong? Stephen walked over, his brows drawn together as he looked at both of us. Charles followed. I felt a rip, and Deer did too, I said, still not finding anything. Corey, Charles said slowly, his arm lifting to point off the stern. I followed his finger, and about twenty yards to my left, there was a strange ripple in the ocean. It looked like water was pouring down into something. Captain, I called, pointing at it. Is that normal? Fuck. Siobhan, swing her to the starboard and step on it. No, you are mine, stubborn creature. I have fought you fair and square. I will win this battle. Carolian's voice snarled in my mind as he reeled in the marlin, its body leaping up into the air, the nose piercing the sky. I glanced at him, but yanked my attention back to the ripple of water that had gotten closer. What in the void? Carolian said with a note of astonished surprise. I whirled to see a large tentacle coming up to grab at the marlin coming down. It wasn't a tentacle like Bob or the other chaos creatures. Instead, it looked like every movie Kraken I'd ever seen. What in Merlin's name? Indira sounded as shocked as I felt. The captain, on the other hand, went white. Siobhan, full speed. I don't care if you destroy the engine as long as we get out of here. There was a jerk of the boat that rocked us toward the stern as the boat increased speed. No! Carolian snarled, sounding like a buzzsaw in my brain. I didn't think I'd ever heard him quite as enraged. Mine! The tentacle wrapped around the marlin and dragged it down. The line snapped, recoiling hard, and Carolian fell backward as the tension disappeared. It took my prey. There was lethal anger in his voice, and his all-too-capable hands started to scrabble to unhook the harness. No one steals prey from me and survives. Don't you dare. You have zero idea how to fight in water, and no matter how strong you are, you still need to breathe. It doesn't. My voice was steely as I moved forward and grabbed his life jacket. Don't make me lose you. He turned, snarling at me, and I just stared at him. The hunt lust, I understood, but he could not go after that thing. The tension faded, and his ears came back up, and he huffed. Very well. Rage coated his words. I think we might have a bigger problem. Charles said softly, and I turned to look at him and the tentacle that was creeping up the hole. Chapter 26 The idea of monsters in the sea has woven through human consciousness since we first ventured out on the water. Some of those monsters have been proven to be real. Whales are terrifying if they come up under your boat. Watching an orca grab a seal off an ice floe is guaranteed to make you nervous. However, we have never had any proof of giant kraken that could attack ships. With the number of ships on the oceans, sonar, submarines, and other exploratory devices, I am sure that if there were such creatures, we would have had some proof. Instead, 
All we have are stories that probably sparked with the first squid ever seen, and just kept growing. There was no proof they have ever existed. Mythological Creatures Fact or Fiction Almost without conscious thought, I grabbed air and sent a lightning bolt at it. There was a weird screech that sounded oddly muffled, and the tentacle ripped away. Caroline was still snarling, and though I let him get out of the harness, we all double-checked our life vests. You have areas of your realm with water? Indira asked. Caroline lowered one ear and shot her a dismissive look. Of course. Where do you think the mermaids live? I almost responded with, Mermaids? Can I meet some? But I bit that back before it escaped. One of these days, I was sitting down with a mythological creature's book and asking him about every single one. Instead, I, along with the other three, stood waiting and watching. Jacob had headed to the bridge. He and Siobhan were trying to get the boat going as fast as they could. There was a shudder, and the boat veered to my left. I fell on my ass, but the others managed to grab for support. Something grabbed your rudder! We're turning! Jacob shouted out. Charles snapped his harness to the nearest fishing chair and leaned over the stern. It's wrapped around the rudder. Give me a second. Charles was an order archmage. He was strong in patterns and preferred to work with data, but it didn't mean he didn't have powers. Another muffled scream, and he stood back up. Shattered the tentacle. Break patterns is fun sometimes. I nodded. I needed to remember that use. Part of me wanted to go hire tutors to teach me all the ways to use the other classes. But for now, I just have to practice. We should probably all secure ourselves. I don't think this is over yet. But make sure you have a knife or spell to cut yourself free if needed, Stephen said, even as he pulled Indira over and secured the harness under her life jacket, then did the same for himself. Carolyn? I asked as I followed Stephen's advice. It also put me in a position to see over the edge of the boat. It had resumed the previous course after Charles had shattered the tentacle. I will stay encumbered. However, I will retain the flotation device. I must be close to fight. Like now! I spun, trying to follow his movements as he darted behind me. The safety line wouldn't let me turn far enough that way so I had to rotate the other direction to see what he was doing. Two more tentacles had reached up on the ship and were flailing around, looking for something else to grab. Caroline growled, a low sound that was almost subsonic, and attacked. His claws came out and sliced cleanly through the thinner tentacle. The second was a good five inches thick, and he slashed twice at it, fast motions and the tentacle fell to the ground. I'd never really seen Carolyn fight before. If he hunted, it was by himself, and while he'd protected me once or twice, I'd never seen more than a bite or a claw before whomever it was decided that death by cath wasn't their preferred way to die. This was another level. Fierce, incredible, deadly. I wanted to just watch him fight and cheer for the blood he spilled. Merlin's balls, Charles whispered. I nodded as I stared. The sudden jolt of the ship shook me out of my fascinated stare. We've got to close that rip. The creature has to be originating from the underwater rib. My voice might have been a bit more panicked than I would have liked, but I couldn't see how big the rip was or where it was. Can you close it if you don't know where it is? Indira turned to look at me. I don't know. I've never done that before. I admitted, as another tentacle came up and Indira set it on fire. The muffled screams of pain were getting louder and closer. If that thing gets on the way into the world, Jules Verne's stories are going to become reality. Charles pointed out, his eyes searching for a new target. That would have disastrous consequences for the wildlife and shipping. Corey, Indira snapped. Listen, close your eyes. It took a force of will to get my eyes closed as Caroline seemed to anticipate each tentacle that came up. Stephen held his hand up 
as if he had a knife in it, and slashed at each tentacle as it broke the surface of the ocean. I realized he was using transform cut to act like an invisible sword, and the offerings it was taking were visible chunks from his hair as he fought. I needed to stop this before we all ran out of offerings. My eyes clamped shut. Feel for it. You know what rips feel like. Find it. You don't need to use it to close it. And Dira's voice pulled me back to my first lesson with her, closing rips. I pushed away everything and just felt. It was like a huge neon flare, but smothered by water. I'd never seen them anywhere except in the sky, but it was there, obvious to my senses. With nothing visible to guide me, I just had to close it by feel. Usually, I tried to push anything back in, but this time I didn't care. I grabbed that zipper and pulled. The rip was open, wider than any other I'd ever dealt with, and I fought to pull it closed. Offerings vaporized, but I kept at it. Corey Duck! Charles screamed out the warning, and I just dropped to my knees. The harness held my torso up as I bent over. Something wet and fleshy whacked right above my back. My eyes stayed shut as I tried to focus on what I needed to do. A screech shattered my concentration, and I felt water cascade up and soak us, even as the boat lurched down alarmingly. My mental zipper was suddenly easy to pull. Shit! I yanked it shut, ignoring the cost, three inches of hair, and sighed in relief as it sealed. But that lasted only seconds. My eyes popped open, and I stood up. It's closed, but we have a bigger problem. The three of them were panting, and Carolyn was soaked in green-tinted fluid. I didn't know if it was blood or ichor, and didn't have time to figure it out. Whatever owned those tentacles got out of the rip, and is now in the water. Probably a bit peeved off at the damage we have done. I glanced around the deck, taking in the bits of sea creature, and the ghosts' white faces of the two crew members hiding in the bridge. We need to kill it. I hated saying that. I had no idea if it was sentient or not, but it couldn't be allowed to stay here. The consequences were too great as whatever it ate normally wouldn't be here, and that meant it would eat what lived here. Prey with no way of knowing how to deal with this predator. Any idea how? Charles looked at me, his face drawn and serious. For a minute, the boy I first met flashed in front of my eyes. Overweight, acne, awkward, not sure how to deal with his familiar. Not the assured man who knew his place and had the strength to stand ready to fight. The expressions on Indira's and Stephen's face were similar. I had the best family. Carolyn, any ideas? I'm starting to understand why seafood is so rare in the realms. My voice was dry as I watched him. You think? His sarcasm was drier than my salt-drenched skin. The beings that inhabit the waters in the realms are mighty. I don't know the exact name of this, but think similar to a kraken of your stories, but with more tentacles. I had kind of guessed that, Charles said dryly. How do we kill it? Like you would anything else. Cut off its head, stop its heart, cut into bits. Any of those would work. I huffed a sigh. That was so much easier said than done. <sighs> you did notice some of these tentacles are bigger than we are, right? You are mages. Do magic, was his response. One of these days, I am so getting you back, I muttered, even as I turned to look at the water and the frothing that I just knew was a creature coming after us. Is it edible? I mean, can other ocean creatures eat it? I stared at the bits of the creature laying on the deck, some still twitching. Yes, though I find I prefer it fried, like your calamari. It is too tough and bland to eat for enjoyment otherwise. He lashed his tail back and forth. This is a large one. Most do not survive meeting it. I can see why. Stephen looked around. We are at a severe disadvantage. Any ideas? Either of you strong enough to fly? Order mages strong in air could fly, but not like a superhero. Well, 
not unless you practice a lot. Mostly, it was a hovering action. Technically, Stephen said, but it isn't a skill set I've used since my college days. The churning water got closer, and I had the mental image of a colossus rising from the oceans toward us. It was unsettling and probably accurate. Indira, how are your water skills? I asked as I gazed at the endless sea. It would be so easy to disappear here, and no one would ever know. Rusty, I mean, I can ice my drinks easily, but anything else? Besides, this is the ocean. No one can control it. It is too huge and fluid. She stated a truism. Not even Merlins could control the ocean. I know, but we don't need to control the ocean. Just the area it is in. If I freeze the water around it, can you dry the creature out? Evaporate? Huh. Sure. But it won't be fast. She said the words slowly, as if trying to figure out how to do it. I nodded, the precious time to come up with a plan disappearing. Stephen, can you and Charles distract it? We need it up high enough so Indira can go for the eyes. I'm going to try to freeze the brain. Are you sure it has one? Charles said, with his head tilted as if searching his memory. Many of our invertebrates don't have their brains structured like mammals. No, but I figure if Indira can dehydrate while I freeze, it should die. Worst case, I'll freeze it completely, then one of you can shatter it. I hoped. If it was as big as I thought, it would take a lot to freeze it. Stephen and Charles both cast me doubting looks, but unless they had something else to try, we were stuck with my idea. The water roiled as multiple tentacles came up, and we were out of time. Chapter 27 I am researching old maps. There is the possibility that rips are actually static in certain locations. Multiple maps from radically different cultures and time periods all have comments equating to here be monsters at the same spots in the map. It makes no sense for all these seafaring creatures, Viking, Polynesian, Chinese, Greek, to have the same notations when their cultures rarely interacted at all. House of Emrys Board I grabbed the water around the creature, trying to make it colder. There was so much. Water agreed willingly to get colder, sluggish, icy, thick. Then it was washed away in the next breath. It wasn't that the ocean fought me. It was that I was trying to change something that changed constantly. But I needed to get that thing closer to the surface. There had to be a better way. Thoughts and ideas rattled around in my head. Salt. Osmosis, water, cellular structure. Would that work? Indira, flood the cells with water. Do the reverse of evaporate. I matched my words with actions, shoving water into the cells every time I saw it. While I did that, I tried to convince the water to push it up closer to us, so I could see it, have an idea of how it was built. The water laughed and flowed and was gone before anything else could happen. Now I understood why no one worked with the ocean. It was impossible. Here, this should work, Charles called out. His hair had significant length missing. I glanced at him. What? Watch. He stared at the water. Trash and seaweed that floated on the top writhed around in the roiling water, twisting and cutting through it. A pattern started to appear, wrapping, weaving over the creature below, Indira and Stephen had paused also to stare at it. Oh, Stephen said. Brilliant. He concentrated, and I watched his hair disappearing into offerings. What am I missing? I couldn't figure out what they were doing. Creating a net from the seaweed and the other trash in the ocean. I'm using reassemble and replicate to weave everything together and twist it around the creature. And once I get a section done, I shove the air into it to make it float. Together... We should have it trapped and rising. I blinked. It was genius. For the first time, I was very happy for trash in the ocean. And once it is closer to the surface, we can freeze or dehydrate it, I said, elation in my voice. Good. Freezing is much easier than evaporation. 
How can we help? Indira leaned next to me, already looking exhausted, and with her normally elegant hair a bit disheveled, with random bits missing. Give us a minute. It really doesn't want to rise to the surface. It is a dweller of the depths, but we shall emerge victorious. Carolyn all but crowed that, and I wondered if he was taunting the thing. Is it sentient? I didn't know if it would change my actions, but I needed to know. No more than any of your sharks. It is a creature that hunts, eats, breeds. As far as I'm aware, it has no relationship with magic other than being a magical creature. Once again, I heard the capital letter. Good. I turned to focus on the water as Charles and Stephen concentrated. As I watched, strands of plastic and seaweed floated to the surface, then were pulled back down, but more and more appeared, dragging a nightmarish creature with it. The tentacles had been a green-blue approaching gray. The creature was mottled with green spots on a brown-gray body. It did and didn't resemble the pictures of a giant squid that I had seen before. It had the vaguely arrow-shaped head and huge eyes, but there it ended. There were four eyes, one on each quarter of the body. In theory, it would have had a 360-degree view around itself. There were tentacles with spear points, some with hooks, and the mouth wasn't the beak I'd expected, and I knew exactly what it looked like as it screamed at us, revealing something more like a lamprey. So many teeth. My gorge rose, though if it was at the creature, the tossing of the boat, or the scream that seemed to cut through my brain, who knew? No! Stephen's yell cut through my paralyzed wonderment at the monster. Carolyn hissed, but he stayed back. Distance fighting was not his forte. Let's go, Indira. I pulled on water and asked it to freeze. I had no idea where the brain might be located in the giant body. It was enormous. From where the tentacle started to the end, it had to be 20 feet. Some of the tentacles were longer than two school buses. They flailed around, trying to hit us or wrap around the boat. Carolyn kept us safe. He was everywhere, the life jacket barely slowing him down as he rushed from side to side, severing anything that crossed above the sidewalls of the boat. I went for the brute force approach and tried to quarter its body. I asked water to freeze it in quadrant lines, hoping I would get lucky and destroy something important. A scream that had been much more tolerable when muffled by water emitted from the creature, and this time I gagged. I heard the others gagging too. It must have affected our inner ears in some way. We needed to kill it. One eye down, Indira announced when there was a break in the screams. On to the next. The frantic nature of the thrashing doubled, and I could see the offerings vaporizing from Charles and Stephen. The tentacle with the spear came up and raced towards Charles. I choked, trying to scream out a warning. A red blur wrapped around the spear and yanked it to the side, and Caroline was there, his claws slicing through the tentacle like a piece of fruit. Keep going. It is flailing. His voice was hard and commanding. Another flash of red as he darted to the other side. I doubled down on freezing through the creature. Three eyes down, Indira called out, and it was obvious we were affecting the creature. It rolled back and forth, trying to avoid the damage we were doing to it, trying to get away. Many of its tentacles had been severed, and its movements were slowing. I managed to cleave the body in half. A line of crystals shattered along its body, and a long, slow screech keened in my ears and brain. It stopped as the body fell apart, broken into two pieces. The tentacles twitched and jerked, but after a few minutes, they fell still. We all stood there, our breaths loud in the sudden silence. At some point in the fight, the engine had stopped. The splash of the waves against the hole and our loud breathing were all I could hear. Did you get it? Is it dead? Captain Jacob whispered as he stuck his head out of the bridge. I stared at it, watching for any twitch, any chance it wasn't fully dead. 
I think so. Creatures are going to eat it, right? Carolan was leaning over the side, his tail whipping back and forth. I do not think that will be an issue. Already the cycle of life is stepping in. We all leaned over to peer into the water. The trash held the creature up at the surface, but I could see small figures darting in and out. When I looked up, I could see fins cutting through the water in a wide swath around us. I see. Can we pull that trash in with us? Somehow. Give us a few. Stephen and Charles put their heads together and started talking. I walked over to the captain. Are you and Siobhan okay? Yeah, we're okay. Did that just happen? He stared out at the creature with a dumbfounded look. Yeah, it did. I couldn't blame him for his shock as I stared at it. My grandfather talked about these creatures and the whaling ships. I always thought they were just tall tales. Huh. That idea resonated through my brain. They might have been real. Creatures that slipped through rips. Maybe out. Maybe back in. All the odd stories of monsters and dragons seemed much less far-fetched. Jacob shook his head, looking at the broken fishing poles, the flopping tentacles on the deck, and the gouges in the wood. If you hadn't been here, this thing would have torn my ship up. You're all scary as fuck, but thank you. I'm assuming you don't mind if we cut this short. I'll need to get the engine going again, but I'm ready to head back. The exhausted chuckles came from all of us. <laughs> Not at all. I managed, sagging to the deck of the ship. Carolyn padded over to flop down next to me. You okay? I ran my hands over him as I asked. There were wet patches, and he let out a soft hiss as I touched some areas. Yes, um, bruises, small cuts, and maybe a cracked rib. But I will heal quickly. He laid his head on my lap. This was perhaps a bit more excitement than I was looking for. Laughter slipped out of me, though low and tired. <laughs> you think next time you want to fight monsters, can you give me a heads up? I would have prepared better. What she said, chimed in Charles. You do realize Erchina is going to be annoyed she missed this. Though personally, I'm glad she did. Having her here would have had me frantic. She isn't a tank. He had curled up against the bridge, sweat and blood on his face. I narrowed my eyes, but I could only see a small cut on his face. Nothing major. But it definitely was a change from the usual. I'm perfectly fine with the usual. Thank you very much, Indira muttered. I'm getting too old for this. And my hair. She lifted up her hair that looked like someone had hacked at it. I'm going to have to spend a week doing magic to get it to even out. I'm just putting mine in a tail and ignoring it. Charles muttered. I snickered and just petted Carolyn. The noise of the waves and the boat engine as we headed back to the harbor created an almost meditative sound. We still have fish, correct? Carolyn asked as we were pulling up to the dock. It pulled me out of the exhausted doze I'd been in. I believe so. Why? I plan on enjoying every bite. I fought for those fish and I'm going to enjoy them. We all rose to our feet as Captain Jacob and Siobhan started tying us to the dock. Carolyn? He twitched an ear at me, though he hadn't moved yet. Are there any land creatures like that? I could feel the other three halt in their movement and stare at me. You know, large, hungry, mindless. Carolyn yawned, exposing his needle-sharp fangs. Not that are carnivorous that I know. There are a few of your woolly mammoths in some of the pockets, but the largest carnivores are the dragons. They are all sentient, mostly. Does that mean we don't need to worry about them slipping out of the rips? Stephen had moved closer while Carolyn answered and stared at my familiar, his face drawn. Carolyn levered himself up, moving slowly and favoring his front right paw. No, yes, 
I'm not sure how to answer. I doubt that Onyx or Smog would lower themselves to coming here and hunting humans. You are rather boring, prey. But some of the others, it is possible. They do not care about the intelligence of their prey, if that happened. He flicked ears backward and headed to the edge of the boat. Then humans will be snack bags. He leapt over the edge, landing neatly on the dock, though I noticed he didn't put weight on his paw. Corey, Stephen said slowly, and Charles drew near. Did you know that? Maybe, I sighed and scrubbed my hands over my face and into my tangled and seawater-soaked hair. Zmog could eat a human and wouldn't feel any remorse about it. I know that there are other dragons that don't have the connection I have with Zmog or Tietang. So, yes, I guess I always knew that was possible. If those three could have gotten paler, I think I'd have worried about them passing out. But, I said and held up my hand, as Zmog proved... The dragons have always had the ability to come here. They don't need rips. I suspect if that was a real issue, it would have happened a long time ago. I didn't bring up the legends of dragons and knights, because part of me wondered if it had been a thing. Stupid teenage games. Point, Stephen said, nodding his head. I wish that made me feel better. I sighed and got off the boat. <sighs> me too. Chapter 28 A dragon was reported in Chile yesterday. It apparently stepped out of a rip, looked around, and then stepped back in. The rip then sealed up behind it. Multiple images of it were caught, but unlike many of the rips, there was no damage. The dragon seemed annoyed more than anything, one witness stated. CNN Mage Focus we ended up with about 300 pounds of fish once it was all processed. We unanimously decided the sea monster was not edible. Indira, Stephen, and Charles took some of the fish, but that still left us with a bit over 200 pounds. I dragged it home via sidestep. Once there, Joe returned from remodeling at the Tudor house to help me put it in the stasis storage Hamadia had created for us while I relayed the events of the trip. I can't see how glad I am we didn't go. I think I would have been useless freaking out over the kids, she admitted. That or all of us would have turned into monsters to protect them. You are much better at the hard, sharp vengeance sort of stuff. I said this as we organized the last of the fish for storage. The remaining was for dinner tonight. Carolyn had consented to let me wrap his paw after a quick rinse in the shower. The stuff covering him apparently tasted awful, so he submitted to the shower with only minimal whining. We verified his forearm wasn't broken, just sprained. As best as he could tell, a couple of the attacks on tentacles had bent his fingers back a bit too far. Hence the sprain. Maybe, but I'd still not like to go that far. Last time I did that, I ended up bald and barren. Joe grinned at me, showing she wasn't upset. But it means the rips are back? I think so. I think we need to change a lot of stuff. The ideas I'd had in the back of my mind started bubbling up. And I really want to take a nap, but I don't think I can push it off anymore. Joe glanced at the clock. It was after four. Well, we got a lot done at the house today. Sable and the kids will be back here for dinner. Fish is a nice treat. You sure it can't wait until tomorrow? I started to say no, then sighed. <sighs> no, it can. I'll get the ball rolling and deal tomorrow. The start of the ball rolling was a call to Shay after I had a shower and a strong rum and coke in my hand. I had muscles hurting where I hadn't realized I had muscles. The shower had exposed a lot more bumps, cuts, and bruises than I'd realized I'd collected. Quarry, I take it the world is ending again. He answered the phone with his comment, and I almost laughed. Probably. You free tomorrow? We, the counselors, need to meet. I lay in bed, Carolyn by my side. He'd wimped out and took a portal upstairs. 
It told me he was more tired than he wanted to admit. I suspected if we weren't having fish for dinner, he'd just sleep through it. I can make time. Where? He sounded tired, too. And I just want to point out this counselor stuff is a lot more than what you sold to me. I barked out a weak laugh. (laughs) Tell me about it, but that is what I want to talk to you about. Let's just do it here. I have lots of fresh fish. Oh, I like fish. His voice had perked up at those words. That is part of the story. Noon, tomorrow, I'll provide lunch. I had a few quick things I could throw together, and Jacob had been nice enough to prep a few slabs that were sushi quality. The nice thing about stasis was it would still be as fresh when I took it out as it was going in, even a few months later. Okay, I assume your cat will come get me. One of these days, my calf will express his displeasure in your denigration of him. Probably, but apparently I need to learn to live dangerously when it comes to non-humans. Shay had a wry tone to his voice, and I chuckled in response. (laughs) Not dangerously, just don't put up with them dismissing you. But that is stuff I'll explain. Let me get a hold of Amadahi. I'll let you know if anything changes. See ya. He hung up, and I pulled up Amadahi's number. It rang for a long time, and I was about to hang up when it was answered. Tanisi? Um, this is Corey Monroe. I needed to talk to Amadahi. One minute. The male voice replied in English this time to my relief. Though, to be fair, it was much closer to three minutes before I heard her come on the line. Merlin Monroe, is there a problem? She sounded older and tired, but then I'd never talked to her on the phone. Maybe that made a difference? Isn't there always? I was hoping you had time tomorrow at lunch to come over so we can discuss things. We need to talk to Nara, also. Ah. She sat silent for a moment, and I was about to make sure the line had not been cut. Yes, we will be there. Explain, then. I will. I'm serving lunch. Is fish okay? Oh? A note of excitement entered her voice. That will be delightful. Thank you. We hung up, and from the scent, I knew dinner was done. Come on, Fuzzface. Let's go eat the fish we caught. If it had not been such a glorious battle, and I hunger for the fruits of my victory, I would pass. I frowned. Is there anything I can do? No. Food and sleep are the best remedy. I shall be down shortly. I leaned over and brushed a kiss on the top of his head, ignoring the fur left on my lips. Love you, Carolyn. Silly queen, you know I am yours. He murmured in my head as he gingerly stretched, preparing to get up. I headed downstairs to find Sable and two excited kids and Ketzos racing around the sunroom. We have our own room, they chattered at me. I know, did you get to look at them today? I asked as I leaned into the hugs. We pulled up carpet and removed doors. We have our own closets, Jazz said with a grin. Oh, do you think all your clothes will fit? I teased her as I moved to the table, still stiff and sore. I think there will be room for more, she said with wide eyes as she climbed up on her chair. Azul clung in her hair. They were almost ready to fly and were about too big to continue to cling to the kids' heads, but that was something they'd figure out. There, his green scales all but glowing with health, had reached about a foot long and was starting to thicken. His body was about the width of a silver dollar. His leathery wings were building muscle, and I suspected he'd fly first. Azul was leaner and longer, and given that Jazz loved to play with her tail— I figured we needed to see about some scarves for the Ketsos to hide in. I bet that I had a nice infinity scarf in dark gray that might work. Carolyn! The cry from the kids pulled me from my mental rambling as Carolyn stepped into the dining room from a rip. His forearm held up and then climbed carefully into his chair. He's hurt! 
Jazz glared at me, as if I'd done it. How did he get hurt? Maine had moved over to him, brows drawn together in a frown. Are you hurt? Do you need your ouchies kissed? It was a very serious question, and was so adorable I had to fight back my giggle. I was hurt fighting a giant monster. Corey has already kissed my wounds. Now I need sustenance to fuel my healing. Carolyn replied just as gravely to Maine. Sit and hear about the fight for the dinner we have tonight. He nodded at the fish that Joe had brought out. She decided to go with the swordfish and mahi-mahi. The swordfish had been grilled and there were five big steaks, while she'd baked the mahi with lemon, zucchini, and garlic. She'd also made a mushroom risotto and a quick fruit salad. You got that? How? That is fish. It's wet. You don't like to get wet. Jazz kept looking back and forth between him and the fish. He'll tell you in a minute. Now, here are cooked and raw cubes of both types of fish for your quetzos. Remember how we've been working on table manners? Joe said as she set down a bowl to the side of both of them. Knowing that we needed to convince them to eat neatly in public, we'd been working on table manners. We'd added the panel back into the table, making it a bit big for the six of us, but it put an entire setting space next to each kid. It was there Joe put the bowl. Yes, mommy, the twin said. Food? chirped one of the quetzos. I hadn't managed to figure out their tones yet. Hopefully, by the time they were grown, they would have recognizable voices, at least to me. Carolyn had no issue with it. Food, Jazz said sternly. You need to eat neatly. No tearing into food. Her mama voice was adorable, and I glanced up to see Sable and Joe smothering smiles. Maine was just as focused on Ver, so neither twin saw our amusement. The two quetzos slithered down to their spots and picked up the small cube. Both of them had flexible necks so they could easily eat from their short hands. They were watched carefully for a minute by the kids, but then the lure of their own food called too loudly. You got this, Carolyn? Maine asked as he stared at the two pieces of fish on his plate. Neither of the kids were picky eaters. The looks of astonishment from Carolyn and Esmere the first time they tried the I don't like that routine and the snarky comments from Esmere had nipped that in the bud. There were days when I suspected we had no idea how much easier our lives were because of the denizens' effects on the twins. I did, or at least many of them. I have no idea if I caught this specific fish or if it was Alexin or Charles. I could never tell what Carolyn was going to call the others. It really depended on his mood. Today, I think he was too tired and hungry to be quite as dismissive of others as he would normally be. That, or they had managed to impress him. But those fights were nothing compared to the monster that attacked the boat we were on. What? Sable and the kids had the same reaction and looked at me with surprise and worry on their faces. Yep, that is why he is hurt, and I'm moving slowly. Let him tell you. I focused on the food. It was delicious. It did taste better knowing we'd rested this food out of the water, as opposed to getting it from a store shelf. After the day we'd had, that extra sense of victory just added to the flavor. Better watch it, or you'll be out hunting with Carolyn. I snickered to myself and let Carolyn tell the story. He had seen more than I and was a natural storyteller, even if he was the hero of the story. Though, as I listened and put together the flashes of red or the sounds I'd heard as we worked to disable the Leviathan, he wasn't far wrong. None of us could have reacted fast enough, nor been able to move on a rocking ship the way he had. A cold shiver went down my spine as I realized we might have very well died today without him. I took a hasty drink of my soda, letting the carbonation and rum burn through the sudden fear. Wow, Carly, it's a hero! Maine gushed, and I nodded. He is. More than I realized. I don't think we would have made it without him. 
Carolan's ears and whiskers flicked forward as his green eyes caught mine. I will always fight for my queens. There was a rumble purr behind his words, and I nodded. How in the world would I live up to this trust in me? Did Esmir, Tursane, Salstra, heck, Bob, also believe in me this much? If I had died today, I would have missed all this. The twins, Joe and Sable. A fierce need to see them grow up and us to grow old slammed into me. Fine. If everyone thought I could fix this, I would. I didn't want anyone to lose their futures because of these rips. The gloves were coming off. Chapter 29 A ship came into the Charleston Harbor the other day, looking like it had been attacked by pirates. Spied leaving the ship was Director of Magical Crime Stephen Alexant, his longtime girlfriend Indira Humbert, and Double Merlin Corey Monroe. One has to ask if they were attacked, and if so, by what? The captain and crew member would not talk to us when asked for information, so we are left wondering what happened. Magical Daily News I had spent the night sound asleep. I thought for sure I'd toss and turn, what with the rips, the council, the herald crap, and realizing we almost died. Instead, I crawled into bed. Caroline sprawled out next to me, and the last thing I remembered was his rumbling purr. By noon, I was ready for guests. I had fresh sashimi plated and threatened to cut off Caroline's tail if he ate it. He had his own personal stash. He didn't need to eat what I had for the council members. I also created a quick pasta salad and grilled a few swordfish I'd started marinating that morning. Fire was so useful in keeping things warm. I'm off to play, bus driver, Carolian said as he stood and walked over to me, rubbing his head on my ribs. Sounds good. I figured Amadahi will get here via Kalichia. See you shortly. I had iced tea, sodas, and some lemonade on ice, and a large coffee just for Shay. It amused me that I still remembered his favorites. A stab of pain went through me, much stronger and more intrusive than Carolyn's rips. I headed out to the backyard where Amadahi and Nara were walking forward. Merlin, Amadahi said, nodding her head, Nara mimicking her. Please, Corey. It makes me feel ridiculous, especially when we need to be equals and united. I invited them in and to the dining room. While it wasn't as comfortable a place to talk, I thought the ability to face each other, not try to juggle plates, and the fact that I could take notes trumped anything else. Everyone else, including Hamadia, were over at the Tudor house working on it. All the low-level remodeling Joe and Sable wanted to do themselves and had the kids helping create their rooms and the family room. I'd watch them tugging up the carpet. It was amusing how hard they worked, but it made it theirs and had the benefit of exhausting them by the end of the day. Win-win. Carolyn strode in, followed by Shay. Hey, Corey. He nodded to Amadahi and Nara. Others. So, what's the what? Afternoon, Shay. Help yourself. I pointed to the food and the plates. I took a minute to fill drink orders, giving Shay his coffee with a smirk. Then I settled down myself. Caroline was in the window seat. He was walking much better this morning, but you could tell his paw was still tender. Let me tell you about our deep sea fishing adventure. I laid out everything with Caroline filling in parts about the creature, the effort, and what it had taken. By the time I was done, all three of them had paled drastically. Amadahi looked the worst with her pallor at a sickly gray-brown. Shay cleared his throat as he twisted his coffee in his hand. <clears throat> Corey, I get that I'm a Merlin, but we can't fight these, and I'm not sure what we are missing in the council sessions. I don't know either, but I know there is one after the first of the year, so about three weeks. I'm going to find out what is going on then, I said calmly. There was no choice at this point. 
And if they obfuscate or refuse to tell you... Amadaki's voice was quiet as she asked that, but both she and Nara had enjoyed the fish. Then I make them. I'm not playing the malleable person anymore. All they do is go on about how I'm the herald of magic and that it is my problem. So be it. It is my problem, and I'm going to solve it. Nara sighed, a low, deep sound that seemed to come from the depths of his soul. <sighs> I gotta say sorry, but I ain't the right bloke for this role. I'm a pacifist and a diplomat. You need a true blue warrior, someone who's up for drawing blood or taking a life. Usually, I'd say you gotta work to find fair ground in this situation. But here, you gotta prove your eagles, and I'm not the one to make that happen. I nodded to the man, understanding his point. I don't disagree. I have no choice but to be the herald and a counselor at this point. Shay broke in. Matt, would you explain why you caved when the unicorn asked you? I sighed and pointed to my arm. The horn, one section of three full. The snake, one section of four full. And the cat nose and whiskers, just sitting there as if smirking, all but gleamed as if they knew we were talking about them. There was a situation. I blinked, trying to figure out how to explain it. They wanted me to prove I could be the herald, or that I was worthy of magic. I wasn't interested in their games, so they kidnapped Joe and Sable, telling me their lives were on the line if I didn't compete. The three looked at me, eyes wide. I didn't have a choice. During that competition, I made an assumption. A bad one, and almost cost beans dearly. Salstra extracted a price from me. I owe her three favors. The tattoo shows them. She called in the first one that day. There was no option, as she could have just as easily demanded my life, and magic would have enforced it. They blinked at me and once again it occurred to me just how weird my life was. And the snake? Shay asked, looking at me curiously. I sighed. Tersane thought Salastra had a good idea, but she felt that she owed me favors. I called in one of them a while ago. I wasn't getting into Carolee and almost dying. That had been terrifying. So technically, I have three more favors she owes me, but most of the time... I don't think about it. The blasted snake knew we were talking about it, and it lifted its head and wiggled a bit, like a squirming puppy. The three of them jerked back. What was that? Shay didn't quite squeak out the words, but I couldn't follow up on that as I was fighting down the shutters myself. That was the snake. It is one of hers under my skin. It moves sometimes. All three of them shuddered in unison, and I took a gulp of my iced tea to push down the revulsion. I hated it when it did that. Dare we ask about the whiskers? That I don't know what to tell you. Apparently Bob was jealous he didn't have a mark on me, so Esmir pressed her nose into my arm and cat tattoo. It at least doesn't do anything. It marks you as Kath, protected and honored by us. And blessed by chaos. It is both a warning, a brand, and a blessing, Carolyn said as he sprawled out. Wait, what? You know, never mind. That actually makes perfect sense and sounds like your mother. I rubbed my head. Where were we? Warriors needed, Nara said simply. If I had to guess, he was very glad that he wasn't the right person for this. Right. Here is the problem. They are requiring one of the counselors be from what they call the beast realm, but it isn't a separate realm, right? That I'd been a bit fuzzy on. No, it is us. Amadahi sighed. Ah, uh, there is a story there. I do not believe we have time to share it today, but I will ensure the tale is shared with you. I believe it is imperative that you understand. There is a book of the Enclave, as we call it, that explains our history, our separation from the world, and the deal we made with what you call denizens. 
But other than their requirement for one of our people to be on the council, it doesn't matter now. I will take this back to the lodge and we will discuss. You know he will refuse, Nara said quietly. He may not have a choice. Amadaki responded with exhaustion lacing her tone. What else do we need to know? I pushed away curiosity about who they were discussing. Right now, it didn't matter. We have rips, the magic that Tursane is still feeding into the realms, Bricks being a jerk, and the task forces being set up. The U.S. government, at least, is starting to freak out and they want to begin to fight back, which I can't blame them, but I have zero idea what the results of that will be or what other countries might be doing. Shay tilted his head and stared at me. You can't ask China? I shrank a bit, then forced myself to stand up. You're right, I can. Want to talk to a dragon? Will it try to eat us? Shay asked this, but I could see the question on the faces of Nara and Amadahi. Tiatang? Doubt it. He's like a huge puppy. Come on. We all walked out to the back lawn. The mid-December weather had a light dusting of snow, but nothing major. The weather called for more snow tonight, but that was Albany, New York for you. Tiatang, do you have a minute to talk to me and some friends? I pinged him, not worried about the time difference. If he was anything like Carolyn, the hours he slept and were awake had little to do with the time of day. Golly! Always. The words had barely finished ringing in my mind before he was stepping through to wiggle around the lawn. He was almost as bad as the Ketzos. His red scales shimmered in the light as he zoomed around, almost flying. Tiatang, can you fly? I asked, curious. I knew the Chinese dragon of legend could fly without wings, but all the others I'd seen fly had wings. Soon, Zmog says soon I will be mature enough to manipulate air, and have it let me fly by flaring on my scales. Look! He shook himself, and all his scales snapped out just a bit, creating little flares of air. I can't wait. I grinned at the image. I am sure you will be wonderful. Tietang, these are my fellow counselors from the Lord's Council, and we had a question. The information I was about to ask for might be considered state secrets, but if no one knew I knew it, then it didn't matter. Of course, anything for Koi. He settled down in front of us, his tendril whiskers drifting around him. The lessons I'd been learning the hard way slipped into my mind. Do I need to pay for this information? My tone was wary, and I ignored the frowns from the others. That was another thing I needed to explain to them. Zmog would say yes, but you are Koi. You find my family. There is nothing I won't do to help you. He squirmed a bit in excitement. Guilt and amusement warred with each other, but I pushed it away. I couldn't afford to not get this information. Are the rips from the realms appearing in China also? Oh, yes. There are many and are scaring people badly. Sissy is not happy. That answered one concern and proved the OMO wasn't wrong about it happening everywhere. Can you tell me what Shishi is planning on doing about them? Uh, she is creating mixed groups of mages, tanks, and many soldiers. We have found a few areas where they are more likely to occur. If they do, the orders are to kill anything that comes out of there. His shimmering slowed down. We thought about this, but she wants any rips that are near tanks to have shells shot into them and is trying to get missiles that can be shot into any rip before the mages close them. They have to close them no matter the cost, even if it is their life. His voice had dropped to a whisper. She does not believe me that this could be very bad. Oh, shit. I tried to remember how to breathe. Does she realize she could start a war between the realms and Earth? 
if she shoots it into the wrong thing, if she took out dragons or Kath or any of the others, they would react very badly. She says they have to cause war on us, and she won't be a placid lotus. His head dropped, and he looked miserable. I see. I'm trying to stop them. Tia Tang, it might be a good idea to ask Smog to talk to Shishi. It was all I could think of. I could try to talk to her, too, but Shishi was an odd mix of arrogant and low self-esteem. If you approached it the wrong way, she'd dig her heels in and refuse to change just because she felt she'd lose face. She said no. She said if the silly human I chose was that stupid, she would remove her and bring me home. I could learn the joy of living with others of my kind. In what sounded like a side whisper but I knew everyone could hear it. She thinks I should have chosen you. Challenge Gillian for you. You would have lost, and I would be sad to lose a friend. Carolian said, his voice dry. Smog forgets things sometimes. That is what I told her. He rippled in a whole body shrug. You are my friend. I like having friends. Play later? Maybe in a week. We can go hiking in the Himalayans again. Carolian agreed mildly. I cast him a look, as that wasn't a trip I'd been aware of. He ignored me, curled up with his paws tucked under him. Yes! Kui, can I help more? Tia Tang turned his luminous eyes to me. No, thank you. That helped a lot, I said, trying to hide my dismay. Very well. By council members. By Kui. By Karin. He wiggled around and slipped out of the yard via a sidestep. It was nice not to get the portal spike. I turned to the counselors, who looked as worried as I felt. I have to figure out how to stop these rips before our worlds destroy each other. Chapter 30 The rips that have been plaguing our country and others have all but disappeared over the last month. Perhaps the problem has been solved. If so, what do we make of the continued unrest being seen in China, Russia, and Brazil at this time? Are they experiencing things we aren't? Or is the United States just lucky? CNN Mage Focus Christmas had been delightful, with Sable's dad, John, and her aunt, Larissa, Stephen, Indira, Charles, Marisol, Chris, Tursane, and Esmir here for a Christmas Eve dinner and gift exchange. Then, for Christmas morning, thanks to Carolian, our family, plus Chris, went over to Paolo's house. The rest of the Guzmans were there. Carolian had the kids fawning over him all day, while we exchanged gifts, ate too much, and generally had a wonderful, relaxing time. Chris filled us in on all the drama at college and his grades, and basically we just leaned into being a family. None of the denizens mentioned anything, and neither did the mages. We all pretended none of the problems with the rips existed. We did get Chris up to speed, though not the Guzman family. Only Sanchez was given a high-level review— just in case we needed Marisol to take the kids. He'd be able to step in and help. For now, Sanchez was still a favored uncle, but someday we knew we'd explain to the kids where they came from. At the moment, he was still single, though I thought he had someone he was getting serious about. January 3rd, though, we had the council meeting. I had no idea how to run it other than I needed answers. Amadahi said she would be sending her replacement in her stead. It seemed like everyone was getting older. There hadn't been any reports of rips that I knew of since our trip, but I was also aware that many of them could be unreported. Rips would close on their own, but I'd never seen anything that said how long it could take. There were reports of it taking anywhere from minutes to months, and in that time, anything could come through, though most people couldn't walk into them. They had tried to explain it to me, but basically the magic that created them made them mostly one way, unless you were a plane walker. 
That morning, I stared at my closet. How did you dress when you were about to declare war? Nothing seemed right, so I settled for my comfort mobility clothes. Cargo pants with thick socks and hiking boots. A tank top, a long sleeve top over it, a travel jacket that had more pockets than even I could fill up, and my backpack. Something told me this might be a very long session. I made sure I had water, food, lip balm, emergency rations for Carolyn, and caffeine. Carolyn, I need you to wear your harness. I called out. Why? I have no need to pacify the council members that I am nothing more than a tame animal. He walked into the closet as I finished getting dressed. His forearm was all better, and he moved normally again. Because I'm not sure that we won't be hitting the ground running, and I'm worried we might need what you have in there. I couldn't swear to it, but something was niggling, and I'd rather be overprepared than under. He laid his ears back as he stared at me, and I didn't understand his opinion. I waited. How full is your backpack? He finally asked. I lifted it up. I had thrown in a book and a few other miscellaneous things, but since I wasn't packing extra clothes, my computer, or anything more than a notebook, it wasn't that full. You're saying, see if I can fit it in there? Yes, I'm part of you, and I do not want them to think you view me as a pet. That would not be good for either of us. Ah, point. I sat back down and did some repacking. His harness by itself wasn't that big, but when I added the bags that held his leash, bowl, booties, and brush, it took up a bit more room. I compromised by making the tumbler I was carrying with me bigger, and I would grab some coffee concentrate. Making water boil, even pulling water out of the air, wasn't that hard. I still had two bottles, just in case, but I'd refill my coffee via magic and concentrate. A jug of concentrate. Thank you. I paused to look at him. Carolyn, you are and always will be my partner. There are very few things I will ever force you to do. He followed me down the stairs toward the kitchen. Everyone else was at work or school. The Ketzos were snoozing, though Hamadia had agreed to watch them. They were pretty easy to entertain, to be honest. She just let them run around her glade and chase insects until tired. What things might those be? He sounded curious, not mad. You roll in stuff that reeks to me. Regardless of how you think it smells, you're getting a bath before you sleep in my bedroom. I stated this with absolute assurance. He'd found a dead something one day and thought it smelled wonderful. I was pretty sure a skunk would have smelled better. He finally agreed to take a bath with soap when all three adults pulled out perfume body sprays and were covering him in them. He whined the entire time about how awful the chemical smelled. We didn't care. It was everything we could do not to gag. He chuckled in a low, rumbling purr. <laughs> Fair enough, I suppose. Do you know what you are going to do? Not a clue besides forcing Bricks to answer me. I'm a bit concerned about Amadahi's replacement. But honestly, if I have to, I'll do this by myself. I didn't add that I was pretty sure when all of this was said and done, I'd be alone anyhow, no matter what anyone wanted. So you will hunt the prey that appears? Exactly. You ready? I had my pack and everything else I could think of. Joe and Sable knew where I would be, and Stephen had been warned of the council meeting, though I'd given him an out this time. If he called the house, we still had a landline, and Hamadia would answer it. She could get a message to me and Carolyn almost no matter where we were. I stood there for a second and let myself realize how truly blessed I was. No matter what else happened, even if I died today, I had been truly and deeply loved. If you please, I waved at the air, and he gave me a cat smirk. The rip opened, and together we stepped in. The familiar gray stone of the council chambers appeared. It seemed we were early, as only Bob and Zmog were here. 
Bob raised a tentacle to quiver at me. I waved back, mostly just amused. Of all the denizens here, Bob was the one I didn't know, didn't understand, and had no clue if it even had thoughts the way I did. I headed over to our area, created a chair for myself, pulled out my thermos, and settled in to watch. When you create a bed for me, I feel like being ostentatious. Carolyn rubbed his head against my knee from where I sat, cross-legged in my large chair. Any color preference? I asked as I assembled a large bed mat from the cobblestones next to me. Gold, I think. It should contrast with my fur. I fought back a snicker and colored it gold, or more accurately changed it so it reflected all the wavelengths except for the ones we regarded as gold. I needed to take more science classes. Why do I sense you are here to cause trouble? Smog asked quietly in my mind. Carolyn didn't even twitch his tail, so it was a private comment. Because I feel the need for some new feathers to be put in my hat. I responded with a glance in her direction. Oh? Zmog lifted her head slightly. Is Ross Bird on the menu? I am not ruling anything out at this point. I paused, then went all in. Has Tia Tang talked to you about what his mage is doing? Zmog tilted her head so one eye had me fully in her view. Should they have? A hint of wariness slipped into her amused tone. Most likely. It will come out during this meeting, but feel free to talk to me about it afterward if you need more information. I stressed the word free, and her head lifted a bit higher. I find myself feeling that I may have preferred the boring meetings prior to your joining us. Most likely. I gave her a brilliant smile, showing too much teeth. Whose tail are you pulling? Carolyn asked, still curled up on the bed I'd created. Just giving Zmog a warning? Ah, uh, yes. This shall not be boring. As we watched, more and more drifted in. I saw Frey, the Kitsun, the Naga, and Tursing come in. The snakes bobbed at me, flicking tongues as Tursing glided over to me. Good morning, Cory. Are you ready for this? Her voice was kind, and I smiled. My smile wasn't. I think a better question is if you are ready for me. Her face went immobile for a split second, and then she gave me a slow, brilliant smile. Oh, this will be fun, will it not? I just kept my smile up. If you sell popcorn... I expect a cut. Tersane burst out into a peal of breathtakingly beautiful laughter that stopped everyone else in the room and focused their attention on us. She kept laughing, and I grinned wider. <sighs> Corey, you are just the best thing to happen. I look forward to this. She managed as she kept chuckling. She slid away, her shoulders still shaking occasionally, it was amusing to watch people drift over to question her, and she just waved them off, saying nothing. But from her snakes, I knew she was still snickering. I see you have started the show without me, Esmir purred as she walked out from the shadows. She stopped to lick the top of Carolyn's head, then rubbed her cheek across mine. If I did not express how delicious the fish you sent back with me was... Let me tell you again, that was wonderful. I snorted a bit. <laughs> now that I've fought what lives in your seas, I'm starting to think I should start a seafood company that sells to denizens. The problem would be figuring out what to charge. I don't need reams of favors owed to me, and trying to liquidate gems and gold is a pain. True, but if anyone can figure it out, you can. Have you figured out what you are going to do? I believe I need some new feathers for a quill set I'm making, I replied out loud. More than one ear twitched my way, and I ignored them. Esmir froze and looked at me, her tail still. I see. 
This will indeed be an interesting council meeting. She licked my hand and headed over to her corner, brushing off people with her tail, as anyone that interacted with me was garnering more and more attention. My queen is causing them to worry. This is a good thing. Caroline murmured, for all that he looked like he was oblivious to the world. I didn't reply, just reached down to scratch his ear. Corey, Shay called from my right. I glanced over my shoulder to see him approaching. This is a new look. Making yourself at home? Oh, I plan on being very comfortable. I grinned. Let's just say I have lots of marshmallows to roast today. He snorted and stared at the stool. <laughs> Would you please? Transform is not my best skill, and my ass hurts just looking at that stupid thing. I tilted my head, looking at him, then focused. A minute later, a Roman chaise lounge began to form, complete with pillows the shade of Esmir's fur. Ooh, I like. He flopped down and got comfortable. More and more eyes were drifting toward us, and I just smiled at anyone who dared meet my eyes. Merlin Monroe, Merlin O'Shaughnessy, I have brought our new council member. I am no longer the right fit for this role. I stood and turned at Amadahi's voice. It sounded older and frailer than a few weeks ago. She was to my left, leaning heavily on her staff, while Kalichia stood on the ground next to her, his eyes not leaving her form. Amadahi nodded to the woman who stood next to her. She will introduce herself. I must go. I apologize for the short notice, but I wish to die in my home with my children. Go, honored elder. You have served your people wisely for many years. I will take the burden from here. The woman spoke in a rich tone that made me think she could sing. Between one breath and the next, Amadahi was gone. Worried, I focused on the woman. She was tall, at least six feet, with a mane of silver hair that was in the Native American braids the history books had told me were traditional. She wore a pair of beige moccasins, skinny leg jeans, a green tank top, and a Harley Davidson leather jacket. Her dark brown eyes turned on us, assessing, weighing us, and I noted she did not dismiss Carolyn at all. Movement caught my eye, and a smoke-gray fox the size of a lynx slipped up behind her, almost invisible against the cobblestone floor. I lifted an eyebrow, but didn't move. She finished her appraisal and nodded once. You will do. I am Sitlali Talians, and this is Cassis. I believe you know my nephew, John. Chapter 31 Foxes appear in multiple cultures as mystical beings. Japan has the Kitsune. Many Native American tribes held foxes as second only to coyotes in trickster roles. It makes you wonder, then, about any mage with a fox or fox-like being as a familiar. What sort of mage would have a creature known for its mischievous ways as their companion? Daily Magical News Editorial I blinked and was about to ask a question when a burst of flame in the middle of the room signaled Brix's arrival. Counselors, take your seats! Brix's words cut through my brain, and I saw Shay wince and Sitlali blink. She glanced at the stool, then our chairs with a flick of an eyebrow toward me. I grinned at her and pulled on Transform to create a seat that I'd seen in a TV series about a land with magic and dragons. A throne made of swords formed, dark, foreboding, and absolutely a declaration of my mood. She raised an eyebrow at me, and I just nodded. I'd have to explain later, if I lived through this. The spectators had moved from the floor to their seats, though I noted Onyx had shown up, something I'd never seen before. He lay next to Zmog, 
their bulk taking up the majority of the lawn. They both appeared to have their eyes closed and to be ignoring the discussions. I had no doubt they were paying very close attention. Another crystal chime, then Brick spoke. Council is cold. Earth, where is your third? The snide tone from the bird set my teeth on edge. I saw Sidlali about to rise, and I waved at her to remain seated. We are all here. The representative from the beast realm is called Sidlali. I didn't stand and barely seemed to pay attention to the phoenix, but I tracked every ruffle of vibrant colored feathers. Very well. Is there other business before we deal with the rips? He asked and I practiced my breathing to deal with the slices of pain. Frey stood, Salstra behind her, acting like a docile animal. We are reporting that the magic levels in spirit are at the highest we have seen, and there has been a slight increase in births. But many of the beings that live there are long-lived and may not be ready for children for another decade or ten, though more seem interested in magic than normal. The Valkyries, as always, are all fully dedicated to magic's needs. She went back to standing behind Salstra and a large Chitarian that sent my hind brain into spasms of fear. That does little good when we need the magic to be used now, and your words mean even less when your kind only have children but rarely, and then dispose of all the males. Brix's words cut, but Frey just shrugged her wings, unmoved by the insult or truth. I had no idea of the social structure of the Valkyries. Anyone else? No one else moved, and I waited. I had a very good idea of what would happen next. Brix had proven to be a bit predictable. Very well, then. Harold, when will the rips be halted? I rose moving into the circle that surrounded him. The chamber itself always reminded me of a large castle hold, long and rectangular, but where we stood was all about the circles laid out in the stone by lighter colored stones. There was a huge ring that bricks perched in the middle of, and four large circles on the outside, one for each of the realms. As a general rule, whomever was speaking would step just inside of the central ring to speak, then step back. It wasn't always followed, but it was obvious it was what passed for conduct rules for them. I reminded myself that strangling the bird would be counterproductive. My steps took me into grasping distance of bricks, which only increased the temptation. There was a slight shift in tension as I did so. I kept my back to my fellow humans and everyone else in my peripheral vision, but bricks was who I focused on. Yes, about that. I'm still waiting for the information on how I am to close them. My words were calm and even. It was odd. I thought I'd be antsy or worried at this point. I wasn't. If anything, I felt more centered and sure of myself than I'd felt in ages. Is that not your job, Harold? The sneer was almost a physical assault in the tone. But be assured that if you don't, it is Earth that will suffer. The realms will be fine, and destruction of your home is no feathers off my back. You were the ones that caused the undoing, so it would be only fitting for you to suffer for the choices of your ancestors. I see. So if I can't close the rips, oh well. It isn't your problem, and you don't need to help. My voice was mild, curious. Exactly. Humans are fragile and too numerous. It would only be fitting if your numbers were cut down a bit. I didn't hear disagreement from the others, but a few snickers did slip in from the spectators. I can see your point, but you might decide that you need to give me a bit more information, because the rips are about to become a very real problem for you and every other creature that lives in the realms. And how is that? Are you going to leave in a huff? Will you refuse the special favors you grant your friends? Brix didn't look at me. Instead, Brix's head attacked feathers that seemed to be in desperate need of being preened. I wanted to follow up on that, 
There were so many things that he was hiding behind his words. No, but what do you know of our wars? The non-sequitur seemed to catch the bird off guard. Wars? Your wars are human problems. Why would we care or know about them? Brick stared at me from under a colorful wing. Esmir, do you remember the little pocket realm you helped me create? I turned to face her, ignoring the puffed-up bird. She blinked her amber eyes at me, but nodded. Yes? Would you show that universe to everyone? Don't open it all the way. Just show it to them. I looked at it a week ago, basically peered through the peephole. It was still a wash in fire, radiation, and power. Even looking at it had given me a headache. Very well. She licked her tail as she showed everyone. It was like having an image presented in front of you, and you almost instinctively leaned closer to see into it. The room exploded in shrieks and hisses of horror, and almost everyone took a step back. The weight of the combined stairs felt physical as I turned to focus on bricks. The bird had almost fallen off the perch, and he was beating his wings to get back to balance. What is that that makes chaos look simple and tame? The words were hissed into my mind, all but spitting the venom in the voice. That was the smallest of our nuclear weapons. We have many that are much bigger. We have what we call bombs that can level cities, dig craters, even leave dents in the moon. Humans are very, very good at destruction. Right now, multiple countries are preparing to launch these weapons into the rips. I knew the U.S. and China were for sure. That counted as multiple, so I was safe from licensing. Imagine if they launched these into an open rip. I know some have opened and let loose creatures. Small, vicious ones. There was one that let in a leviathan. Others may not go anywhere. But can you imagine what would happen if one opened over the dragon's nesting grounds or Salister's grove? What about the plains the Cath hunt on? Zmog and Onyx were both sitting up and staring at me. Dragon faces weren't good at expressing emotion, but the black smoke billowing up from their nostrils and wreathing their heads said worlds about their current state. There was an explosion of chatter and fear as the other counselors whispered among themselves. I kept staring at bricks. So, you're right, Earth might be destroyed, but I'm betting there's a much better chance that if we launch a few nukes into the rips that the resulting death and destruction will take centuries for magic to heal, and that would drain the magic overload. So, I mean, I guess I can do nothing. Let each country deal with it as they choose. Bricks actively squawked, launching himself into the air and hovering right in front of me. You dare! You are the herald! Your job is to protect magic and repair the damage. This is your fault from the beginning, giving away so much magic. You say I'm the herald. I leaned in, my nose less than five inches from his beak. Excellent. Then the herald demands your assistance to save the realms. You should not need it. This is your job. Bricks turned brighter, with flames flicking around feathers as the phoenix shouted at me. Then why should I care? You won't help me. Therefore, I don't need to worry about your realms. I can make sure Earth knows exactly where to send their weapons. We will be fine if that happens. I turned and managed two steps toward my chair. You will listen to the council! The words were shrieked, and an involuntary wince pulled my head down, just enough to miss the buffet of wings that slapped across where my head had been. I whipped around, my left hand covered in water, as I swung at the bird. It was a hard backhand that slammed into the fire-covered chest, There was a lot of force in my hit, and Bricks cartwheeled in the air three times before catching the air. You dare! The words were hissed ice that stabbed into my brain, doing nothing but raising my anger. Yes, you are not my master, and you hit me first. Come at me! 
I taunted the puffed-up bird. My right hand was held up with a ball of ice in it. Part of me was aware of the shock rippling around me. Most of me didn't care. The attitude had to go. A wing was waved at me, feathers of flame darting toward me. I flipped my left hand, pushing air in front of me as I flung the ice hard. I didn't dare pull my punches in this fight. The ice headed for the center of Brix's chest. A few flaps of wings, and it looked like my ice would miss. But I sent a gust of air under it and it went straight up, catching the tail where it exploded into water that I froze as it soaked the feathers. Brix fell to the ground like a rock. For a moment, all you could see was colored feathers flapping in an effort to sit up correctly. A flash of flames, a cloud of steam and the bird was back on the perch. I turned, glaring at him, ready to incinerate the wood he stood on. Pax! Pax! Tersing called, her voice cutting through the chatter, the mind speak cutting off everyone. Brix, you have shown enough arrogance for a while. Cory has proven she is not to be dismissed nor used as a pawn. Either run this council with equality or I will call for a vote of no confidence and will vote in a new head lord. Her voice caused a ripple of shock and approval as Brooks and I faced off. He ruffled his feathers twice, not looking away from me. Humans were what caused the undoing. It is up to her to fix it. Learn your history, human. The answers are there if you are strong enough to find them. If not... Then magic chose poorly. She has before. Council is ended! Before anyone could respond, he flared up and disappeared. But this time, I felt how he flew away. It was similar to sidestepping, smaller, focused. But I was pretty sure I could stop it if I wanted to. I nodded to myself and turned. Everyone stared at me. The attitudes ranged from shock to reconsidering, with a few smirks in there mostly from those who knew me. Shay and Sitlali just stared at me, Shay more openly than Sitlali. I strode back to them. Come on, next step. Are you insane? Shay muttered as he rose, his face paler than it had been. No, I'm a Merlin. And I, Merlin Blasted, won't be treated as lesser by a bird. Sitlali gave me a long look. We should talk later. Yes, after. Now come on. I spared a glance at Kirlian. He was still curled up, looking like he hadn't moved a hair with all the fuss. Kessis was curled up next to him, as far as I could tell, sound asleep. With two humans in tow... I headed directly to order. Tersing, I was pretty sure, would tell me what I wanted. Chaos was next. I didn't bother to hide my smile as I stalked toward the Unicorn, Valkyrie, and Chitarian. I needed information.